Welcome, hello, uh, welcome to Denmark, welcome to the first barbershop in this country. Uh, today we will focus on how male and female leaders will, from the public and the private, private sector, can work together on achieving gender equality. My name is Abdelaziz Mahmoud, I am one of two brown people in Danish television. Uh, the other one is called Nasser Kata, and I'm not him. Um, so just remember that, I'm not Nasser Kata. Um, ever. So I am uh, a journalist and I wrote a book last year about uh, integration, so that is one of the pointers that I make, one of the speeches I throw uh, now and again, is talk about how, I'm, how we are Palestinian refugees and how my father uh, supported my mother at the time when we you know, first came into the country, we wanted to make friends in our neighborhood, my mom wanted to make friends, so she uh, knocked on our neighbor's door asked her for coffee, the neighbor turned her down, closed the door, and then my father said, let's do something, you know, uh, something different. So my mom made this rule about that all of the whole family should sit in the front yard um, at all times and just wave to the neighbors when they walk by. <laughs> Super awkward, yes, <laughs> embarrassing. And then she uh, um, baked some Arabic uh, pizza bread and then she asked me and my brother to like uh, pass it around in the neighborhood, like it was business cards or or it was like hunger, hunger situation, you know, and people were like, thank you, strange Arabic boy, I'll certainly eat this spread. And, and then she, you know, <laughs> then she knocked on our neighbor, Edna's door, and Edna wanted to drink coffee with us. And she was a lovely woman and they had a good friendship. One day Edna could smell something different uh, from over the other side of the, the porch. And since she, she walked over and asked her, my mom, what, what it was, and then she had her first falafel. And uh, a few months after, for Edna's 50th birthday, she switched, she, uh, uh, she uh, refused to serve the usual tzadileta, which is this awful, weird pastry thing with chicken in it. And then she served these chickpeas meatballs, as she called falafel, so everyone could understand what it was. And then my mom also learned a lot of things about uh, from Edna. She learned to do this tin foil, um, I would say, ashtrays, like this tin foil. Um, like this size, under your, under your uh, chin, so you could get sun from, from under your chin. <laughs> Many Arabic people need to be more dark <laughs> and tanned. So it was an equal neighborship. On the other side of the, um, of the, other side of the street, Pia walk, uh, moved in. Pia was this, you know, independent woman. And she, when, she, what, uh, when she tanned in the, in, the, in the yard, she would do it topless, you know? She'd do it topless. And my mom would, uh, also became friends with, with Pia. I'm just glad that she met Edna first. <laughs> Don't have to do everything that they do, mom. Um, so yeah, that was one of the stories that I tell about how we can, I don't know, motivate people to learn new ways even though that they're stuck with their old habits. Now, of course, in this country, we're talking about burkas and the cops, but we're not going to go into that today. Instead, uh, I'm going to be the MC for today, and I'm looking forward to present the high quality of the speakers today uh, that will share their experience, experiences with us about uh, or uh, for the aim of identifying uh, effective ways to advance equality in the workplace and also in the home. The barbershop is not a traditional event. The goal is to create an environment where we can securely exchange ideas and experiences. We will also uh, cast a spotlight on you, the audience, uh, both during the barbershop workshop and also the commitment uh, section. And first, I want to introduce Foreign Minister. Uh, it's an honor to welcome our first speaker. Um, his wife was al also a success successful businesswoman in Iceland, so he knows firsthand what it is to be he for she. And he will share with us why Iceland is focusing on mobilizing men for gender equality. So I know that I'm gonna screw up some of the names today, but keep in mind that you can't pronounce my name either. So um, <laughs> please welcome Gudle Gur Tua Torason. I can assure you that uh, this is not the worst pronunciation of my name I've heard. <laughs> but my name is Guðlaugur Thór Thórðarsson, and uh, I will check out later on today how, uh, how you would do when uh, pronouncing it. But uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, 
It's a pleasure to welcome you here today to the Barbershop Conference held under the auspice of the Nordic Councils of Ministers. I would like to thank the Nordic team and the UN women here in Copenhagen for the excellent cooperation we have enjoyed in the run-up to the conference as, the, as well as the remarkable group of academics and speakers from the public and private sector who agreed to join us today. At the current rate, gender equality will not be reached until the year 2133. Something has to change. With men largely missing from the debate on equality, we are playing with only half the team. <clears throat> like every Icelander, I'm a fan of football. And we know to win the game, we need everyone to pitch in. I'm optimistic. Most men agree that gender equality is no-brainer. Discrimination against women should not exist in the year 2017, and we should all be free to be who we want to be. We know that empowering women is the right thing to do. We also understand that it is the smart thing to do in every aspect. Hence, we only need a little nudge to translate our sympathy for the cause into action. This is what the barbershop is all about. It's a training camp of sorts designed to equip men with the tools they need to take on an active role in achieving equality. In our discussion here today, we will shed a light on our unconscious biases and get an insight into the day-to-day -day experience of men and women that sometimes reflect persistent and rather old-fashioned social norms. Understanding ourselves and our peers is the first step. Making a commitment to change something in our own behavior and lending our voices to equality is the next one. The Nordics lead the way globally when it comes to gender equality. We know firsthand how the increased respect for women's human rights and their active participation in the labor force has contributed to our well-being. We are still determined to continue to make progress, but our ultimate goal is not to continue leading. Our ultimate goal is for all countries to achieve gender equality. Today, we have gathered Nordic policymakers and representatives from trade unions, business association, and private companies for a dialogue on how we achieve this. Too often, these two sectors, the public and the private, are kept separate. But gender equality concerns us all, and our goal today is to share best practices, learn from each other, and be inspired by those who are leading by example. We will focus on equality in the home and at the work, two sides of the same coin. Sharing the work at home allows men and women the opportunity to perform equally well in the workplace and reap equal pay for work of equal value. It also allows us men to enjoy more time with our families and take equal responsibility for our children's upbringing and well-being. Our goal here today is not to solely discuss the importance of gender equality. We already agree on that. Instead, our focus will be on, on the how we do tailor our policies so the advanced gender equality and how we, do we go from good policies to good practice. Our speakers today will share their stories, but we will also put the spotlight on you, the audience, in the hope that today influences long-term change. I am pleased to see that so many men have decided to join us for a discussion on how to achieve gender equality. I wish you a fruitful discussion and a sharp barbershop. Thank you.
Thank you so much. And the next uh, on stage has been um, Secretary General of the Nordic Council of Ministers since 2013. The Nordic Council has focused for a long time on the importance of gender equality for the prosperity in the Nordic countries. And the Sec Secretary General will share with us how Nordic solutions to gender equality can help, s uh, inequality can help solve this uh, issue globally. So please welcome Mr. Dag Finn Hoibrotten. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Excellencies, ministers, it's good to see you here. Gender equality is a hallmark for the Nordic region because we know it has made us one of the most prosperous regions in the world. Over the years, we have experienced nothing short of a Nordic gender effect, especially in the workplace. Leading on gender equality comes with huge responsibility. We must share our knowledge with other countries and even companies on how to make it possible. But equally important, we have to, uh, the responsibility to close our own gender gap. Our work here is not done. This morning, I want to salute Iceland. You are world champions. Well, not yet in soccer, but you're on your way. We're very proud of you. But also, you are world champions when it comes to women's participation in the workplace. No one can take that from you yet, but uh, there are other Nordics coming after you. And you have also, as a government, led the way by introducing legislation on equal pay. That is really leading by example. So it makes a lot of sense that you are uh, co-hosting this barbershop here today. Last month, I was uh, at the UN General Assembly in New York to talk about gender equality, and I brought home two messages that are very relevant for our exchange here today. First, men must raise their voices for gender equality and participate in making change happen at work and in home. And secondly, the business world holds an important opportunity in changing the game and leading on gender equality for better work-family balance, both for women and men. In New York, I learned that the, I should say, Nordic-initiated uh, Spotify company has introduced a six months paid parental leave for every full-time employee, both women and men, and it has already transformed their business culture. In just three years, Spotify has seen an increase of women in the workforce going from 22 to 46%. Our Nordic Prime Ministers have recently launched a flagship project with the goal to raise the Nordic voice for gender equality internationally. We call it the Nordic Gender Effect at Work. We focus on four key areas. Shared parental leave, access to childcare, flexible working times, and gender equality in leadership. To the companies present here today, when you act in an international forum, you have the opportunity to advance gender equality by sharing your experiences, whether it is about gender-balanced leadership or providing parental leave. This is precisely what our Prime Minister's initiative and flagship is all about. And finally, I cannot stress how, uh, enough how there is no room for complacency in this issue. There is still much to be accomplished, and when it comes to men's role in facilitating women's economic empowerment, there is a huge potential for growth for uh, expanding your businesses. I believe the exchange here today is crucial to facilitate the learning. And to set the tone for the more personal sharing of experiences, I want to share with you my experiences with working with uh, gender balance on boards. Because I was a member of the Norwegian cabinet when we uh, encouraged and um, challenged the major businesses in Norway to uh, balance up their boards, gender-wise. And it didn't help. You know, the, the voluntary uh, line didn't work, at least not within the time frame we had set. So we had told them that if it doesn't work, we'll legislate you. And so we did. And it worked. And it's been working for 13 years. And uh, there is now an answer to the question 
that it is always raised when you introduce this kind of issues. Will there be enough women willing and competent? Don't listen to that question. Don't listen to that idea that there is not, because we're approximately the same number of people on both genders. So that's not the issue. The issue is if structures are uh, opened up and uh, facilitated so that this can happen, and so that we don't miss out on the opportunity of having balanced boards. I went on to the global uh, scene uh, as chair of uh, Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. It's a public-private par uh, partnership. The UN uh, agencies relevant are uh, playing a, an important part as partners, but they're also private sector and uh, governments. And we had a wonderful gender policy. And I was so proud to have passed it in the board. You know, I said it called for gender balance on all committees and, and on the board itself. And then I raised my hand. I wasn't chair at that time. I was just a member. And I said, what about this board? I mean, there are 20% women, and the gender policy says balance. So I became the chair. <laughs> and I was in for a he for she kind of experience because I decided for myself and I told the board, I will not uh, allow any appointment to the board as board members uh, of men until we have a balance, men and women. And so that caused a lot of problems. I'll ta I, I won't tell you because there are so many diplomats here, I can't tell you. But there were some diplomatic uh, complications uh, following that decision. But it happened in, in a relatively short time. We heard all the arguments. You know, there are not, we don't have a vaccine expert in our country that is a woman. I said, I don't believe it. And of course, in a few weeks, they had one. She was good. She may be, have been even better than the men they had thought of. But they hadn't thought of her. So. I'm proud to say that happened, and uh, I, I left the board uh, a year ago, but, but I checked yesterday. It's even, it's even better now. So it matters, leadership matters, and uh, don't believe all the, uh, all the good reasons uh, you're given for not doing it. Just do it. That's the slogan. And it's smart, it's right, and it, for me, it's about the dignity the human dignity of every single person on this earth. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yes, it's on. Thank you, so gu uh, guys. If you want to join on the conversation, if you want to uh, maybe quote some of the speakers uh, today or some of the things, if you want to continue the debate, please use the hashtag BarbershopConf. That's barbershop. Conf on Twitter, for example. Today's key speaker is Peter Grunberg. He's a senior vice president of, of a culture and organization development. In his role, Mr. Grunberg oversaw Volvo Group's global work of analyzing and redefining its work environment with the goal of creating a culture of inclusion and equality. This included a strong commitment to making the workplace more gender equal. As keynote speaker, Mr. Grunberg will share why he is so passionate about advancing gender equality. And as he says, it's not enough to be aware. We must also be convinced at heart to make true progress. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Peter Grunberg. So now I have the mic on also. Great. Uh, two and a half years ago, uh, I was asked by the board of directors uh, for Volvo that, Peter, we need somebody in relation to the enormous business challenges we have in front of us to look into what kind of structure, culture and leadership do we need in the Volvo group going forward really to reach our targets. Uh, that has been an extremely interesting journey to drive that within our company. Uh, today we're a company of 100,000 employees. We operate in 190 countries. We have 10,000 leaders and uh, 13 different brands that we operate uh, from different culture perspective also. And one of the building blocks to do this transformation have been very much around diversity and inclusion 
based on gender equality? And then you can ask, ask yourself why? And I think there is a very easy answer to that. Uh, there are actually two. The first one is very much that our base values is based on the human rights. It's said here, gender equality is a human rights issue. And for me, uh, then leading this question, and as Volvo being the largest company in Sweden, of course, it's our responsibility to be a driving force to create a world where every one of us is free to fulfill our dreams, regardless of the background or gender we have, and use our full potential. So then you can ask yourself, is it like this today? I will put up some numbers here, which is quite interesting to see. 298, 17, 6, 43, 80. I'm also an engineer but uh, working with this question, so I think it's, it's good with some fact also. These are the number of companies listed on the Swedish Stock Exchange in Sweden. These are the number of the Swedish CIOs in this company that are women, 17. 6% is the number of that. It's actually, I think it increased by one women between 16 and 17. So to your point here, we will reach equality in somewhere in 2135 with this pace. The interesting thing, where you had a female CEO, the number of uh, females in the uh, management teams was 43%. Where the men as the CEO, 80% were men. Uh, then some others, quite shocking figures. It should be. I will do it once more. Well, Allah. Maybe we should, I should have prepared this before. But so. And this study is done by the Swedish organization Albright, and it's extremely interesting. Albright.se, go in and read, read this report. Uh, so this is percentage. So in all these 298 companies that are listed on the stock, stock exchange, zero, uh, in 27% of those companies, we have uh, zero women in the management teams. In 36%, there is only one women in the management team. So that means if you do some maths here, more or less 60 percent, more than 60 percent of all management teams only have one women in their management teams in, in the listed companies. And then it's only here, you have two on 18, three, so it's only four, 10 percent there are having four or five women in the management teams. Volvo today actually are having four women, so one of the four percent in our management team. So we are not living and we are not have we are having structures that hinders women to take place in our management teams and this is of course a huge problem the second thing why we are so it's so urgent for us to work with these questions around it's around problem solving today the car industry is going through a huge disruption since 1927 cars has been built on diesel engines you have had to drive them yourself and they have not been connected now all cars will be connected, there will be electrical engines, and they will be self-driven. This will totally change the way business model, product-wise. So we as a company, to, s to be in this disruptive world right now, we need to be the best one in solving problems. We need to be a problem-solving company. And then it's also, also interesting to relate to that. To, 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 to how do you be creative in a company? Uh, then there is a, a very interesting study done by MIT here, when you look on the, the, the collective intelligence in a group. And you can see that the, the main correlation to, collect, to collective intelligence in a group is social sensibility. It's around uh, uh, shared speaking time, and that correlates very much to the number of the women in the group. So if you, they did a study on 192 teams where they clearly saw the women factor in relation to co collective uh, creativity. Uh, so if there is in the study you see that you need to be 65% women to really take away the male dominance and uh, to, to have the best creativity problem solving. It's also interesting to see how you perceive yourself in a team. If you're a very homogeneous team or if you are a balanced team, 
The homogeneous team have a tendency, and we can see this in, in the studies we do, all, do also, that uh, you, you perceive yourself to be very efficient. You have a strong self-confidence, but when you then look into the accurate results, it's, it's very much so that the, the balanced team is it's much better. So this is why it's about being able to, 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 to fulfill human rights, and it's due to be best in creative solving. So then you can ask yourself, how do we work with these questions? Uh, I think like a lot of other companies, we work with policies, we measure, we train, and we network. When it comes to the policies, I think they will not make much of a difference. We also have this code of conduct and DI policy. I think it's one policy that has made a difference. We, in, we post all jobs within our company, all jobs. Not jo one job is not posted. And in all recruitment process, there are always a woman and a man in the decision body to, t to, to, to take the final decision. Uh, when it comes to, to uh, m measuring, we are measuring the balance team indicator. All 10,000 management teams within are having a balance team indicator where we measure age, nationality, and, and gender, and having targets on that. And we also me measure the inclusion rate on that. And we have a very simple way of work with, with inclusive management. A formula that is spread throughout the organization. We believe very much that we as a company, we need to create results. That is based on, on uh, cooperation. Isn't it interesting when cooperation is not working within the company? What you do, you start to reorganize. That is the first thing you do. Or you, you start to, to you we need to have role descriptions. What do A, B, and, what do, and then you start to draw very heavy lines between them. Or you draw process charts until you die. But for us, it's very much about creating a, a culture of openness and trust in everything we do, and that is based on dialogue. So why is this important? Yes, because if you are to, all our management teams are not there to take decisions. They are there to solve problems. And if you are to solve problems, you need to have, I have so, seen so many dysfunctional management teams. And why so? Because there are hierarchies in my management teams. And this could be built on ethnicity, it could be built on gender, it could be built on experience, whatever. If you would like to be a good problem solving team, you need to erase the hierarchies and create a team where everybody could bring in themselves and be themselves. And this creates a lot of work. And we work a lot across the organization to array, array, take away hierarchies in management team, create problem solving teams. And this is done by having a feedback culture, open and honest dialogue, and invest a lot of time on this to create this environment where you take, I think you can feel all yourself being in different teams. This always exists and it's more or less impossible to take away. This is also the, 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 the ground for having inclusiveness. If you have hierarchies in society, in companies, in teams, you will not reach an inclusive culture. Uh, so that has been, when it comes to training, I think we very re early realized that we need to have men a part of this journey. If we should change the way you saw with 60% in management team having no women, we need to have men engaged. So we have since 2010 have for all top executives men having the walk the talk training where more or less now 150 top executives in Volvo have spent one year only talking about gender equality and class being a speech you can talk a little bit about that because you're part of that training also so that has been extremely successful to train the top men in conscious, unconscious behaviors. And when they come out of this training, very many of them say this changed their lives. Both how they are as fathers, how they relate to life, because I think it's a lot to relate on masculinity and, and that all of us should be free as individuals and not hindered by norms in relation to gender. So that has been very successful in, in, in getting the men on board. And that have also led that we have networks of men, not only networks of women to drive this, you need to have networks of men in there. And that network is called Real Men. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Coinback. So, <clears throat> for those of you who are thinking, what is this woman? What is this, this they're talking about? Shouldn't we see one of those? Yeah, we should now. And it's not because she's a woman. It's because she do an excellent job about uh, uh, in this field. It's uh, she's a senior research fellow at the Norwegian Institute for Social Research and. Core. In her current research, she studies the changing wage structure using a non-use of the father's quota and gender differences in labor market outcomes. Ms. Ostbakken will today sh share with us her findings of a research on the economics benefits of uh, women in the Norwegian workforce, uh, workplace. So please, of course, please um, welcome Ms. Kjersti Misha Ostbakken. Oh, it's not. Okay. Oil, gas, wind, waterfalls. All of these natural resources are important for our economies. But none of these are the key resource for our sustained welfare. That's humans. Our skills, our competencies, our talent, our labor. The Ministry of Finance in Norway reports that current and future labor accounts for 75% of our uh, nation's wealth. Capital and natural resources account for 25%. So clearly it is vital that we allocate labor efficiently in order to maintain our level of wealth and welfare in the future. Equality in the meaning of the absence of discrimination uh, is primarily a fundamental human right, of course, but it's also economically efficient. For example, if the barriers to employment are very high for a certain group, say women, and the demand for their type of competencies and skill is high at the same time, but labor supply and labor demand are not able to meet, we have frictions in the labor market, and frictions are inefficient. So gender equality could, in that case, improve the efficiency of the labor market. And in situations where we have employers who only recruit from half of our pool of talent, for instance, equality may lead to better allocation of our human capital. Higher efficiency in production of goods and services is also a potential consequence of higher female employment and more gender equality due to specialization and economies of scale. So this perspective that equality also yields high returns, that it increases our production and enhances economic growth is one of the backbones of the broad public and political support for gender equality policies in Norway and the other Nordic countries. So today, 1.2 million women goes to work in Norway, making up nearly half of our workforce. But this gender balanced workforce has not always been the case. In the 50s, for instance, we had what we can call the golden age for housewives. Men worked, women also worked, but they worked unpaid in the home, caring and providing for the families. Throughout the 60s, the 70s, women increasingly fought for the right to gain higher education, for the right to work and for the right to plan their careers. So the educational revolution, modernization, technological change, new norms and new preferences for female work uh, uh, inc uh, led to increased labor supply among women. At the same time, at least in, in Norway and the other Nordic countries, we also experienced higher demand for labor. The service sector increased, it, ex it grew, and in particular due to our, the expansion of the welfare state. And then the demand for especially female labor also increased. In addition, we had some institutional changes. The Gender Equality Act and the ILO Equal Remuneration Convention prohibited direct and indirect discrimination of women. But we also had, we also had the introduction of generous welfare and family policies. And we also had the access to uh, part-time work which reduced some of the barriers that women experienced in balancing work and family obligations. None of these movements happened isolated from the other, but all of them are very important for the rising female employment over the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and also into the 21st century. 
So through these four decades, our labor market in Norway expanded, our input of labor into production increased, and our mainland gross domestic product, which is the GDP without oil and gas, uh, grew by 2% annually uh, since 1972 to 2013. 90% of this growth is due to productivity growth, due to technological improvements, more production capital, and also higher education, but 10% is due to growth in employment, meaning more hours worked. The entire 10% is attributable to female employment growth. In fact, we also had employment growth among men, but this was offset by a reduction in work hours. So men's contribution to our economic growth in terms of employment or hours worked is 0% over this period. So much of, of women's employment growth was channeled uh, through the expansion of the welfare state. The welfare state employs many women, and the uh, welfare state also uh, have got transferred some of the, the tasks that previously was part of the private sphere, like caring uh, for young children and elderly. So part of this restructuring process led to what we can call altered bookkeeping. Now in our production, we count things that we previously did not count. So this altered bookkeeping, all these simultaneous processes that happened at, uh, at the same time makes it a bit hard for me as an economist to identify the true effect of women on the economy. So are there any ways of quantifying this economic benefit of raised female employment? Well, my approach is best understood as a thought experiment or maybe a time travel. So if we all just go back to the 70s, to the time where women's opportunities in the labor market were fewer, and to a time when, at least in Norway, we only employed 600,000 women. Then we imagine that the processes that led to increased female employment never happened. We just employ 600,000 women each year for a 40 years period. What will the value of our market-based production be then? Well, our labor input will be lower, so our production will be lower. And in fact, it would be 3.3 trillion Norwegian kroners lower accumulated over the entire period. To put it uh, differently, raised female employment has contributed to production worth 3.3 million since the 70s. This amounts to 9% of our accumulated GDP over the period. So despite this significant contribution of uh, women, into uh, women into our economic growth and in into our production, it is appropriate to ask another question. What if the labor market had been even more gender equal? Today, the participation in labor market, as I showed, is nearly gender balanced, but we know that the part-time share among women is still at staggering 40%. So let's now imagine that all women worked as much as men. That means basically that they work full time. Then the labor input into production would be higher and it would be, would, and our GDP would have been 2.3 trillion uh, Norwegian kroners higher for the entire period. So these, these numbers are quite stylized examples, rely on some, some would say, strong assumptions. But we have reasons to believe that these uh, amounts are lower bound estimates of uh, the benefits of gender equality in terms of market production. Here we've only counted the hours worked. We have not counted the quality of the labor. And we all know that the educational revolution has gone very far and now women outnumber men in, in the higher education institutions. We also know that the benefits of women in the workforce and the benefits of gender equality um, goes far beyond market production. It's important for women's economic liberation, it's important for their empowerment, it's important for, for men, it's important for children, it's important for the society. And these are factors that's not straightforward to quantify. 
in any meaningful way. So I have this one take home message from me to all of you, and that is the following. In one of the most gender equal countries in the world, where labor force participation rate is uh, gender balanced, we still have underused and valuable labor resources among women. I feel it's fair to say that we have not reached our full economic potential yet. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Spaken, thank you so much. Um, and our next speaker, I'll just remove this because we're going to use the floor in a moment, but um, our next, spe next speaker is head of uh, Copenhagen University Hospital, uh, PhD, and um, president of Men's Health F F Forum in Denmark. He's been researching men and fatherhood, men's health and men's mental problems for several years, years, and in his talk he will share with us why we must also think of researching gender equality when it comes to the well-being and health of our men. Please welcome Sven O. Massen. Yes. yes, thank you for the invitation. I'm going to speak about how to engage men by looking into some of the gender inequalities there are for men. Maybe not because there is discrimination, but just because there are inequalities. And I'm going to talk about it in three areas, public health, education, and parenthood, which I think is are one of the, the main areas we should look into when it comes to to men's uh, inequality for men. We all know how men are, and you know men uh, has been in this position for several years, and, and we know that's what we are fighting against. We have this guy here who's done the uh, way of the homework, who's taking part of it, but when it comes to health, you'll find out that this guy, he lives seven years longer, no short, shorter than his wife. And that's how it is when you look uh, around the world, you'll see that in the countries where there is most suppression of women, the, there is the biggest difference in, in uh, life expectancy where women has the longest, uh, lives the longest time. And when you look at the global development right now, you'll see there is an increase in the difference in men's and women's life expectancies. So for the uh, past uh, 35 years, the difference has grown with 30%. So there is a big change in the world where women gain life expectancy more faster or faster than, than men do. And that's not only because of, of uh, birth-related deaths. When you look at the, the uh, life expectancy at uh, 50 years, it still is growing with, with 30% over those years. So it's very important to find out why is it going like this for, 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 for men and women. And when you l we look into Europe, see there are differences among men uh, in Europe. Iceland always wins, one of the most equal countries in the world. There's also the smallest difference in life expectancy. So Iceland will win this time. We hope to meet you in the final in the world soccer. Uh, but in the poor countries, the differences are growing. So the poorer country there is, the bigger is the difference in life expectancy between men and women. So there are differences among men, but there are also differences between men and women, and the differences are growing the more poor the countries are. And if you look into Denmark and see how is the development right now, you'll see that the 25% poorest men in Denmark are lacking behind all the other groups. So when you put the social status into the gender uh, perspective, you'll see that uh, the poorest men are lagging behind in life expectancy so that the difference between the, the, the richest men and the poorest men in Denmark over a period from 1987 to 2011 has grown from six years to 10 years. While when you look at the women, they are uh, having a parallel uh, movement. So there's six years between the richest and the poorest all the time. So what we have is we have one group of men who are lagging behind, and that's not only in Denmark, but around the world and around in all the Nordic countries. So that's a perspective when you want to engage men in 
gender equality, the gender equality fight, I think it's very important to say there are also gender inequalities related to men's gender. So when you look into the men's mental health, there's also uh, very many areas where men's mental health has not been looked at and not been seen that many men actually suffer from mental uh, illnesses but are not discovered, not diagnosed, and not in treatment. And that's, uh, for example, depression. Normally we say that uh, double as many women as men suffer from depression. What we know is that half of the men who suffer from depression are not discovered, are not diagnosed, and are not in treatment. Also, when you look into men's perinatal depressions, which is uh, barely uh, recognized around the world, maybe Denmark, I think, was one of the first countries in the world to recognize this as uh, a fact that men can get uh, perinatal depressions too. The result is that men commit suicide three times as often as women uh, through the lifetime. So what is needed, I think we, what we need is to have st strategies for changing this, strategies for changing the men's uh, higher mortality in all diseases strategies for recognizing the mental illnesses in men and strategies for uh, reaching out to men. I think if we should wait for men to change, it will take very many years in health uh, psychology and health behavior. But what is possible to do is to reach out and find new ways to reach men and, and uh, get, give them better, uh, better health and, and lower mortalities. So where are the men and women moving when we look into education this year? You know m women get more education than men, and this makes big changes in, for example, the Nordic countries. If you look at, at this map, you'll see in the dark blue areas, there are up to 10% more men than women living there. If you look into the red areas, I have put some arrows on just to find where the women are. The women are the majority in these areas because they get education and they get jobs related to the higher education. So we have a difference in, in, in Denmark, in all the Nordic countries where men are in the majority in the rural areas where women are becoming the majority in the, in, in the big cities in, in, in the countries. So this is related to education, this is related to health, and this is related to uh, demographics. So that is, uh, and I think this is changing more and more and, and, and uh, growing this thing. And this leads to that we uh, are having a society of very many people living a single life. In Denmark it is so that 45% of all the unskilled workers will uh, live a single life all of their life. And what does it mean to live a single life? Yes, it means that men who are single will live seven years, have a sh seven years shorter life expectancy than men who live together with other people. When I started studying, I was afraid first that it was a, a good thing for women to be single, but fortunately it's not, but it only costs half of the lifetime exp expectancy for women. So what does that mean? We just had a new research here in Denmark showing that up to 25% of all men in Denmark will never be fathers and it's 45%, th sorry, 35% of all unskilled male workers will never have a family, will never be fathers. So this is, and has an impact on health, this has an impact on mental health, this has an impact on how you enjoy your life. So this is a very big imbalance, which I think is important to look into. So a lot of thing about this is about education. And when you look for the Danish figures, you see that 44% more women than men get a higher education. And this is a total revolution of through just 30 years or something like that. Women have seen that education is a uh, thing that makes liberation, that like makes uh, you uh, strong in the world. What projects should men have? The, unfortunately, so that a lot of men in, in our schools in Denmark, young men do not get an education, drops out of education, much more men drop out of education in our country. And we have a whole lot of young men without education, without only scarce jobs, and with low self-esteem, with bad uh, mental uh, thrives. So the other revolution, 
we have is men are becoming fathers actually. And what do we know about fathers through our history and what do we know about in culture actually? You know, when you look into the European mythology and history, fathers have been very strange. Uranus puts his children back into his mother. Cronus swallowed his children. Zeus had f uh, 15 illegitimate children. Odysseus said, you know, like men do, I'm just going to get something, and he came back 20 years ago, <laughs> 20 years after. And you know, Abraham were ready to sacrifice. He was stopped, his son, he was stopped. Agamemnon, who wanted to fight at Troy, he actually offered his daughter to get some wind to, to uh, go to, to, to uh, uh, Troy. So now in, in our new days, you know, fathers have been coming up and we are going to, to meet fathers getting close to their children. This is one of the first ones. And then there was a big change, you know, for the first time in a, in a mainstream culture, we had uh, a, a, a movie telling that men could, a man could actually have a closer relationship with his child than the mother had. This was revolutionary. You had never seen anything like that in the whole human history. And then, you know, there has been a development on how men can actually relate and attach to their children. We have seen a lot of one, the Swedish ones here, he's still smoking, but he will stop uh, <laughs> soon, I hope. Uh, there were some fathers who were very engaged, but not all of them were as nice as we hoped they would be. <laughs> so we'll get away from him as soon as possible. But actually, what we have is a, ha a father-rich society which we have never seen ever in human history before. Fathers attending births, fathers being together with their uh, babies, we have never seen anything like that. But I think we can help the fathers. And we're talking a lot about parental leave here, which I think is very important. But also the, so to speak, total recognition of men as partners, as parents on equal terms of women. Better understanding of the psychological transformation of men becoming fathers. And I think what we should recognize is that just as we have seen women go from the home place to the working place through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, maybe we should recognize that men at this time actually is in a movement like this just th in the opposite way. Men coming from the workplace and getting close to their family life, the close relation, being a parent, being together with their children, and surprise, surprise, they meet the same problems, the same things that are different in work, home, balance. And I think it's a better way to understand men right now at where are they and what are their problems right now. This is a way also if you recognize that, to engage men in the fight for gender equality. Thank you. Thank you, Svenu. Thank you so much. Thanks. And thanks for bringing Bill Cosby into our hearts again. Thank you so much. We needed that. Actually, I heard yesterday that Alphonse Aubert's uh, father is only 36 years old. Did, didn't he look a bit older, though, with the pipe? Yeah? So fathers don't smoke. Or just do like I do, don't have kids. Um, so let's talk politics. Um, so for the next hour, we'll share some examples of policies that have helped advance gender equality. Uh, right, uh, for the second half of this session, we'll talk to IKEA Group and Reykjavik Energy, uh, how they have gone from ambitious policies to successful uh, practices. But first, we're going to hear from the highest level of the public sector to learn about their proudest achievements and also their uh, biggest challenges. So please help me wel welcome Ms. Karen Illemann, Minister for Equal Opportunities and Nordic Cooperation of Denmark. Give her a hand. And Ms. Ögon uh, Samuelsson, Minister for Social Affairs, Housing Policy, and much more. <laughs> have a seat. Actually, you both have a lot of, like, you have a big resume, so, but you're a minister of a lot of things, <laughs> uh, both of you. And can I get, get a mic each here and turn it on? So what do you think so far? About <coughs> about the things we've we've heard uh, today so far. Um, this is on, huh? Yeah. Uh, the most uh, impo interesting things is to hear how similar uh, the challenges are in the Nordic countries. I think, um, for example, uh, the last one about uh, uh, working uh, uh, education and women. Uh, we also see in the Fair Islands, for example, that uh, it's a majority of the women that is uh, taking education and men are 
uh, hunters and fisher, fishers and have uh, not so uh, high education. So you can see uh, uh, everywhere in the Nordic countries uh, the challenges are maybe the same. So, so do we still have challenges? Do you still, I mean, we, we keep talking about the Nordic countries as being the, you know, the, the, the good guys in the world uh, mm. when we talk about uh, equality. Do you st still have, do you th still think we have big um, challenges? Sure. We definitely have challenges in every single Nordic country and around the globe. In, ger in general, speaking of equal opportunities, I don't know if you noticed, but I insist on calling myself Minister of Equal Opportunities and not Minister of, equal oppor uh, of uh, Gender Equality because I think it's very important that we move beyond the gender issue. But you started asking us what was the most interesting thing that we've heard so far this morning. And I think one of the biggest challenges, honestly, is what Sven just showed us about the inequality when it comes to men's health. I am seriously worried about inequality when we look a few years ahead, looking into how women are very well educated and how men in general, when we see the educational level and when we look into the health issues, are lacking behind uh, lived years and the quality of the lived years. So I think one of the major issues that we really need to tackle is basically the knowledge about the equal opportunities that we do have in our countries. I know we do it in different ways when it comes to parental leave and the the political discussion in Denmark when it comes to parental leave is very often a uh, earmarked uh, parental leave schemes and so on. And I'm definitely not in favor of earmarking it, but I'm very much in favor of making it aware to both the men and the women that you do have equal opportunities in sharing the parental leave schemes. And that is indeed necessary to actually also make sure that, that men in, in, in basic have live better lives as being and managing being both fathers and, and, and workers. And then there's all of you who, who do not have children, and that's not the issue that everybody should have children. But just focusing on, on this point right now with the parental leave schemes, that's where you really see some of the of the problems arising for very many men. We'll talk about that later, what, what uh, success stories you have for us. But in Faro, you have different... Um, challenges, um, Mr. Samuelson, you, you, you talk about uh, young um, boys and girls, but, but women leaving the country, studying abroad and never coming back. Yeah, uh, that's one of our biggest challenges. And it's uh, more uh, girls that leave, or women, uh, than boys. And the boys are staying back in the rural areas and have traditional jobs. So you get uh, maybe a double gap between education and the critical mass of the society is, is abroad. And, and the challenge is to get them back, to get more diversity in the society. And why do you have this gap? Why are young women leaving the country? Um, I think it's uh, because of they can see uh, it's very smart to have an education. And we don't have had so much opportunities for higher educations in the Faroe Islands. But now we have, um, now we have, uh, more um, education opportunities for the last few years. The university has doubled its uh, uh, opportunities, and we can see that it's reversing a bit now. So, what, what have you done to 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 reverse the um, these these co these conflicts that you have? Uh, we have had campaigns uh, uh, that we have called "We Choose the Pharaohs." Uh, both for uh, tourists to make it uh, an interesting place to come and also for the young people to to choose to come back and work. And, uh, and uh, it has changed our image, I think, from a backwards society to a more, um, more um, interesting place to be or more cool place to be. And, and the economic growth is very big at the moment, so that is uh, also making it easier to come back because we are very, when the e economy is going down, it's going fast down, and people are moving abroad also to work. And, and when it's going up, it's going soon up, and then, so we have some big, uh, uh, I don't yeah. know how to call ups it. Ups and downs, Ups I guess. and downs, And for yeah. the first and, time and ever. And very fast. 
And I guess uh, I heard that uh, the first Kosha time ever. ever we are 50,000 people. Yeah. <laughs> it's not much for a country, but it's much, uh, it's much for us. Yeah. Um, so you have d we have different challenges here in, in Denmark, and you, you mentioned it just a, a bit before about par parental leave and about, can you maybe elaborate about what kind of policies that have changed the way of men uh, taking a part of it and which challenges we still have in this country? Well, basically, I think it's extremely necessary that that all parents are aware of the possibilities. And honestly, we've seen some figures that that men does not really know what possibilities they have. And honestly, we also see some figures and some research saying that very often the mother-to-be is having this kind of, well, parental leave is, is, is it's mine. her right, yeah. No, but it's mine, mm -hmm. and it's maybe uh, the father can, can have some part of it, but, but it's not really that much an issue. And it's extremely necessary uh, to, uh, because I'm, as I said before, I'm definitely not in favor of earmarking it and forcing the families 50% to you and 50% to you. I, I really believe in the freedom here for the families to arrange it. But being so that able is how it works in Denmark, just to make it clear, that, that, the, that, that the parents can go together and say, you can take these weeks, I can take these weeks, or exactly. you can, yeah. Exactly, and of course, we have seen a huge, uh, evol I mean, a, a huge improvement in the schemes for men as well. Uh, when we do um, the negotiations and, and the wages, uh, companies, and you've given the examples as well, companies are really starting now to say, this is a focal point for us, this is a way to make us attractive, that we do have good parental leave schemes for our employers, uh, employees, sorry, and that will be both men and women, and that is extremely important that, that you make sure that everybody knows about it. For instance, the huge uh, telephone company, TDC, they have been very much focused on this and have had a huge cultural change, having leaders, having ambassadors saying that I do take my parental leave, I do it for myself, for my wife, for my, um, the mother, for our child, our family, but also for the business because I'm definitely a better uh, worker, a better employer, if, uh, employee if I uh, have the balance in my life, knowing that I'm also needed and wanted in my personal life. And that comes back to the important messages from Sven before the men's health issue, being balance being needed not only in work but but in I mean in the whole setting as as life. Ms. Samuelson? Um, I think uh, yeah we have a bit different approach to it in the Faroe Islands we have also uh, some weeks that are only the mothers and some weeks uh, that the par parents can choose themselves but lately in the last uh, two years we have added uh, two more weeks to the father alone. He had two, now he had, has four. And, and, and we are discussing how to get more to the father. Because uh, we think that um, uh, the companies and, and the father himself s seems uh, to feel it's very difficult to take parental leave when, when we can choose. Because what is the difficult? What is that? What is difficult? Is it uh, uh, the private? Uh, yeah, the, in the private sector, and also maybe because we are uh, traveling abroad or fisheries and have uh, such jobs, but they are talking much about uh, it's not so good. And and we also have experienced that uh, maybe uh, the industry don't seem to see it uh, is uh, is smart that the father take parental leave, mm -hmm. and then it can be a way to. Um, that they can see it is smart when, when we have to say at least four weeks is the father's. Mm -hmm. It can lead the way to see uh, how, uh, how good it is for everyone, for the family, for the father, for the child, mm -hmm. for the industry. So it's a bit different approach, May maybe. Maybe it's not that different because we do have in, in the parental leave sch scheme program, we do have the things in the very beginning, because mainly it's still, mainly it is still the mother giving birth. <laughs> often. Uh, often, but uh, you can have adoptions and all of that too. Mm -hmm. So, so, but mainly we have this earmarked in the beginning because of the mother giving birth and, and breastfeeding and all of that. But when it comes to the parental leave, and that's the difference between 
barsel og forældreårlov. That's the Danish word, just to know the difference between the two. But that's where it is extremely important, the part where the child is a bit older, where the parents actually even more easy can share it. And what you're saying there about the culture in the businesses mm. and the culture amongst fathers, amongst families, amongst friends, is extremely important. I was noticing by, by coincidence a program on one of the Danish TV channels, uh, Fathers on Leave, which is an extremely popular program because you suddenly find somebody to identify yourself with. We've had many mother groups, mothers on parental leave with the trolleys, uh, go, going to baby gym and, and baby movies and all of that. And you always see the picture where it's the mother and the child. And we really need to be much more focused on the necessity to have this shown in, a, in an equal way. But who are we, Ms. Element? Because you're talking about the media now, you're talking oh about yeah. CDC as a private company, mm. Mm. but how much should the state interfere with this? You just told us that you w don't want to put um, you know, this and these weeks on exactly. the father. So, so and, and luckily I do have something planned. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's hear. <laughs> because not doing the legislation on the earmark, but making sure that, that businesses and, and the workforce do the cooperation on on the payroll, but what we have done right now, and we started actually within a month, is a huge campaign that we're going to start, and it's not only like a minister, minister campaign, definitely not. It's the organizations, uh, I mean the uh, labor market, and the, the big industries, big industries and, and the big companies going together in this what we call action daddy leave, uh, freely translated. But it's like a huge campaign where you kind of have this tag, we are active in action fathers leave. We do these different initiatives in our companies. We make sure that every father to be is also offered uh, a conversation on how do you actually plan your parental leave schemes, making sure that you have all of these kind of um, mother and father groups. So all of these initiatives will be in the huge package of this action daddy leave. It will be on social media. It will be all over to create the awareness to make sure that this dialogue is taken between the, the upcoming parents, within the families, amongst friends, and definitely in the businesses. And it will actually be a, a campaign running for, for several years. So being and taking part of Action Daddy Leave is something that I really expect much from. <coughs> Just don't, don't, you don't have to, like, um, you know, it it almost sounds like, ple Daddy, please don't leave. Like, it's, it's a different campaign, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, stay. So in, in the Faroe Islands, you succeeded uh, getting some of the women back in the to the country. Now, what is the next, what is the next move uh, now that they are coming back or staying? Um, what are you doing for getting um, the, qu that the country to be more, I don't know, um, equal. Yeah, equal, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, it's... Uh, one of the things is, uh, is, of course, to, uh, to make uh, the businesses work together with, with us about things like parental leave, because I agree with Karen that uh, the awareness and, and, the ca and campaigns and, and things like that is also important to make a mo more uh, diverse uh, society. You have to see role models. Um, we, are working s we are working slowly to get uh, get the, the society more more modern than it is today, and and uh, that is something uh, um, the working conditions also because we have, I think we have the highest uh, grade of uh, women working in the Faroe Islands. It's more than eighty percent, but the more, uh, but the half of them, fifty four percent are working part time, and that also. Uh, is something about who uh, has uh, has the the leading role in the family? I think so that uh, you are you are showing things by working part time, but you are working. So that is one area that we also have to look into. How how can you uh, uh, not necessarily work uh, full time, but how can you share things at home and and get more uh, opportunities at work? So what is the the, the biggest? Um, uh, difficulty right now is it uh, the mindset of people or is it the state or is it the p the private sector like what is <laughs> what is the next what is the biggest um, obstacle 
I, I wouldn't say that this is a, a, a blame game, but I, I think it's extremely important that we all keep on creating awareness of the necessity of actually creating equal opportunities and being very focused on the diverse boards, the diverse jobs in general. And, and looking into the history, uh, the other thing that we saw that mo this morning, uh, women coming into the labor market, creating our welfare states, our institutions, part-time jobs for, for the women. And it's, it's true, we, in Denmark we have equal pay for equal work, but we very often fail on speaking on all the unpaid work, all the work done at home. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of work, what we're trying to do, I think I have to admit that we, was, we were very much inspired by Sweden, but that's how we help each other in the Nordic countries. We have created this initiative where you can actually, where you, where you buy help for, for all the services and also creating a business in that kind of service industry. For instance, uh, buying help for the, for the uh, cleaning of the houses, for the shopping, whatever you do, and you can actually deduct it on your tax ticket. So you, you have this initiative saying, okay, you, you, you uh, collect all the bills and when the year's over, each, each adult in the household can actually deduct uh, in, in the tax bill. So that creates, uh, I would say, um, probably more equal, uh, equal division within the unpaid work. But you also need to create awareness of all the work in having a family and having a household run. And, and that is something that we, uh, I think, often fail to do when we talk about uh, how we get our wages in the in the labor market? How about all the unpaid work? So you say you're getting um, inspiration from, example, Sweden. Do you have any? What I what are your ambition going forward now? Like, what do you like to do? Something about parental leave is one thing, but do you have any um, goals for the next uh, um, years? Where do you want uh, your uh, countries to be? Uh, I would like to say uh, it's very important that women uh, in the Faroe Islands. Uh, um, I, I said before, m uh, a big uh, number of them have high educations, but we don't see them in boards yet uh, in the industry, and we don't see uh, many female leaders. So I think uh, that's a very important area issue to to work on. To and get how, how, how can you work on uh, that? Together with the businesses, and maybe we have to make a law about it. Uh, I'm not uh, afraid of making laws, but I, I would like to get awareness about it first, and, and, and maybe they can c commit themselves. So uh, a law could be that uh, yeah, you have uh, to have a certain percentage of the yeah. boardroom uh, mm -hmm. employed by, by women. Yeah, we yeah. have had a campaign in politics in the Faroe Islands, but women in politics, that mm. was something that we uh, achieved from the West Nordic countries. It went from 15% yeah. to 30%. To 30%, and now we have to broaden this out in the industry and, and, and in the working places was, was that was that Was that because of politics that you went from 15% of women in politics uh, to 50, to 30? It was a, a committee that uh, the West Nordic uh, countries uh, agreed on to. It was from uh, copied, copied from Iceland, exact, uh, and um, it was a campaign to get women en engaged in politics and to get uh, men to uh, men and women to elect women, yes. and and that has gone very fast. Actually, I think it started in 2008, and then we now we are 30 percent in parliament, and and the government is 50 50. Uh, we went from in 2008 there were only men in the government, and mm. and in. Uh, 12, there were one woman and seven men, and now we are 50-50. So if we can make these changes uh, in out to the industries also, mm. that's very important. So this government o o uh, often, in, the, in Denmark, often gets, I don't know if you can call it teased, about not uh, being 50-50 mm. uh, uh, when you talk about min uh, equality and um, what you call gender equality in ministers. But also when you talk about boardrooms, you're very against forcing um, this, yeah, you're, you're not. Let, let me just admit that I'm liberal, and that's why I'm not really. Uh, it's not that I'm afraid of legislation. I do lots of legislation, but I think there is a, 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 a to a certain extent, legislation is not the way to go. And I think it's a great example from Faroe Islands that you actually see the increase of, for instance, women participating and running for, for seats in politics and doing it through awareness. 
And in, in my perspective, I know that, that Norway has done quotas in the boards for women. And, and, and I know that they are saying, of course, the figures are there because they've made legis legislation about it. But what they are also seeing right now is the discussion of what, what is, what is the, the feeding into these positions. And I definitely think that we need more diverse boards in our companies. And I know that the companies want the same because it's good for the baseline. People and boards make better decisions when you have a diverse board, when you actually look into the problems from different perspectives. And only a diverse uh, board, can, board of directors can do that. So in that perspective, you need to, to have a more diverse mindset when you look into it. So what I see, you started, uh, you ended up asking what are the big Ambition, challenges. Yeah. I think uh, we definitely do have some big challenges in the way uh, women and or, or girls or boys choose education, choose which kind of education to take. We do still have uh, some very, um, some some very strange. Well, not strange, but that's just a fact right now. That still a majority of women are in the the caretaking business in the pedagogue and the, the school system and so on. And we still have a majority of men in in science and and technology. And, and these kind of, of cross uh, uh, seeks is, is necessary. Is that something you're looking into? Yes, we're looking into that, looking into having more girls and, and women choosing STEM, uh, the, 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 the science, technology, uh, and math lines, because we definitely need a more diverse uh, um, mass of, of educated young people in this, not only a majority of boys. So we look into that, not with legislation, but with awareness, creating awareness, both for parents when you give advice to your children in what education to take, but of course also for the, for the, for the ground schools to be aware of how you actually uh, give advice to young people when it comes to choosing education and looking into future opportunities. Ms. Samuelson? Uh, I think it's a combination of, of the two things, uh, awareness and campaigns and also like legislation. Uh, I don't want to jump to legislate uh, immediately, but if you take the campaign about uh, women in Ferris politics, uh, it uh, has been tried many times before it actually uh, happened. It happened, it was the third or fourth <coughs> time you had campaigns and campaigns and, and talked about the issue, but it didn't uh, succeed. But suddenly it did after so many years. So it's something about uh, you have to uh, make awareness and you have to talk and uh, to talk about things and, and 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 get them in the open but you when, when it's uh, general structures in the society I think you also have to if you don't want to wait too long you also have to legislate sometimes so it's a combination of both things I think and, and some things takes too long <laughs> if 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 you don't legislate, but uh, but that's only my opinion. But you help to to combine these two things. I think. Allow myself just to 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 end this uh, dialogue with just a small interesting finding. Uh, in the Nordic Council of Ministers, we were discussing how the different boards in the different Nordic institutions, how how did it actually look on on the gender map. So we made a research, there are no quotas in there, but we made a research and it was extremely interesting for me to, to look into these different inst institutions because free to my memory, there were like five or six institutions saying that uh, there was extreme men, extremely many men. It was like 80% men, 20% women. But there were also like four or five where it was the opposite way around. But the discussion to start with, the presentation was only, there you have the problem. There's 80% men and 20% women. I was like, yeah, but there's also a problem there. You have 80% women and 20% men. Yes. So we need to be very much um, diverse in our work and making sure that we don't, I mean, right now, yesterday we had the UN uh, Girls' Day, Girls' Child Day. Uh, my social media platforms were taken over by, by two young girls from Bangladesh talking about women's rights and 
ending child marriage and all these extremely important things when it comes to girls' rights. But I have been, you know, having huge debates from men being very angry about this. Why do you make women take over your side? You're only a minister for women. And, 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 and it's, it's, it was extremely interesting to see that kind of frustration. So I think we just, all of us, need to be very aware of the equal opportunities and not uh, being so extremely only focused on, on the figures, but on the equal opportunities. No doubt it's a sensitive area. Thank you so much. Uh, it's two very different countries, two very different ways of doing things. Mrs. Seleman, Mrs. Samuelson, thank you so much. And we just talked about how, which role the, the private sector can, can have in this. So now we're going to, in a minute, we're going to talk to, or with uh, Reykjavik Energy. But first, uh, we're going to, uh, during today's event, we're going to bring you three presentations we, which we call Leading by Example. And we will hear two of them now and one of them after lunch. That's uh, Nokia. Uh, Sarah Brody, the Global Equality and Leadership Manager at IKEA Group, to, uh, will share with us why IKEA has invested so heavily in ensuring that uh, IKEA is a diverse uh, workplace. She says it's simply smarter business. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mrs. Sari Brody. Yeah. Yes, it's on. Thank you. It's quite humbling to be here. Um, I've been working with the area of gender diversity and equality in general for quite some years, I would say 15 years at least with IKEA, but also before. But this is the first event that I am where men actually initiate it, take the lead, and truly believe in it. And it's humbling and it's fantastic at once. So thank you for that. Thank you for all the participants here. I wanted to share, what I will share is our systematic approach at IKEA what we have gone through, where we are today, which I think we have quite impressive results, but still we have a long way to go. And I would say, when it comes to engaging the men in such a proactive men, we have just started going there. So I'm getting a lot of, a lot of inspiration already thinking about, okay, I need to go back home, and how do I engage more men in our organization? So for us, if I succeed in moving the presentation, hmm, it's here. I click. There it is. So for us, it all starts with our vision. We actually have a fantastic vision. It inspires and it guides us. So the dreams and the wishes of people to have a better everyday life is actually in the heart of everything that we do. And um, at the same time, our vision gives us the opportunity but also the responsibility to act beyond home furnishing. If we want to improve people's lives and to have people have better life at home, it's not only our coworkers, it's about our customers, but it's also society at large. So being in such events, collaborating with NGOs, with governmental agencies, and with other companies actually helps us reach this vision. So I will go to, uh, talk about what is gender equality for us at IKEA, because we kind of split it into two components. And I think, Peter, from Volvo, you spoke about it. And I definitely want to collaborate with you, but it sounds like you're doing quite a few things that we could learn from you, but also share. Because we start with the diversity, so it's about numbers. Before we have a critical mass, we cannot talk about cultural changes. So first, let's talk about bringing women on board, bringing them on to leadership position, and we have quite an ambitious goal. We have a goal of 50-50 women and men in all leadership position, in all functions, and in all organizations at IKEA. And it's very 
very ambitious because of course, as you know, there are some sectors that are more female dominated and then exactly as you said, then we need to bring more men on board. And then there are sectors that are the industry per se is very male dominated. And then we need to bring more women. So just having an average equal organization doesn't actually reach the goal of equality. So we start with that and looking into what are those differences. But then for me, what I've been actually discussing in the last four years at the IKEA group is once you have the equality in the numbers, you have only started your work. Because the real work is an inclusive culture. The real work is not where women try to fit into the men's business world. It's when women are women and men are men. And then they have complementary skills and tasks. And then you have changed the culture. You can see the feminine and you can see the masculine. And you can see the creativity start flowing. And that, I think, is a bigger challenge, for us at least, than just having the numbers. So why do we do gender equality? And I would say, when you come to the Nordic country and present, that's a no-brainer, because all of you here talk about the humanistic approach. Fantastic. But I come from the US, and when I talk about the humanistic approach and the culture, they're saying, yeah, but that's not a reason for a business to focus on it. Show us the number. Does it make business sense? And I always say, wait, <laughs> not for us. So it's quite uh, refreshing to be in an event that everybody knows what I'm talking about. So when we talk about humanistic culture, we have a very humanistic culture. And as you all already said, for me, equality is not only a human right, it's fundamental human right. So it's a no-brainer that we treat men and women equally. We start from there. It's, uh, for me, it's more, let's make an effort, people make an effort not to do equality, it seems like. <laughs> so why don't we do what should be fundamental? And at IKEA, we really pride ourselves for being a humanistic, values-driven culture. Then we need to walk the talk. And what we said is, we will walk the talk. We will show that we treat people regardless of their personal background, in an equal way. It starts with gender, but we work on many, many other dimensions beyond the gender. Then the, the second reason that when we talk at IKEA is there is a new reality. So the new reality is the world, as many of you also have mentioned, has more women than men. It's 51% women, and yet, when you look in schools and graduation from, high, from uh, um, universities, it's more women than men. But somehow, it does not translate to economies. So women don't make more money or not even equal money, and women do not participate in leadership position and on boards. So somewhere along the way, there is a disconnect, and it doesn't translate directly into, so let's see it in reality. And um, the pay gap. Today we have average pay for women 11K and for men 20K. At IKEA we committed by 2020, every single organization, every function at IKEA will pay equally to men and women who are holding positions of equal value. We started some companies, some countries, and organizations already have accomplished it. And when they say, but it's financial consequences, my answer is, well, did you think about it before? Financial consequences? So we have no excuse for that. Everybody is expected to put it on their budget. By 2020, IKEA group with 150,000 coworkers will pay equally to men and women holding jobs of equal value. And that is a huge, pride for IKEA. So if we continue in the same way that we are going today, as you saw probably in the World Economic Forum, it will take us 170 years to close the gap. We don't have time. That's why we decided let's create business coalitions, let's start impacting society 
so that it comes back to impacting the business world. And then, of course, needless to say that when you focus on equality because it's the right thing to do, you will see the business results. But me, as a woman, I can tell you, I don't want to hear that, yeah, we recruit you because it's good for the business. Recruit me because I have a high level of competence and I can actually help. And because it's my right to be in the labor pool and have equal rights, just like any other men. That's what I want to hear. And so what we found is that companies, and also in IKEA we find it, that when you have men and women sitting in a leadership position together and you have a management team that has both men and women, all of a sudden they start challenging each other in a different way. And everybody becomes smarter, more challenging, more creative, new solutions, blended solutions are coming. And it's not, I can complete your sentence because I think exactly like you. Because that for me is a waste of human power. So when we think differently, when we disagree, when we complement each other, this is when we add value, not when we are exactly alike. So there's plenty of research that has been done in so many countries and in so many companies around the world. Boards and management teams that are comprised of both men and women perform better on all indices, indices, not only on the financial index. So there's no need to convince anymore that it's good for the business. So a little bit about our systematic approach, just want to share it generally and some of the examples because of course we are headquartered in Sweden, in the Nordics, with this culture. But we operate, just the IKEA group, in 29 countries. We are in Asia, we are in Europe, and we are in North America with IKEA group. Different cultures, different emphasis on equality, so we also need to look into what do we do with the infrastructure. Because when I listen here, and your government is creating the infrastructure that enables equality between men and women, in many countries of the world, it is not the case. So we as a company need to take it on to just equalize what you're doing here already. So for us, it's a little bit of a bigger issue. So if we start, we always start with it's values-driven culture. And we tell our leaders, if we are values-driven, let's show it in action. So you will see we have policies on equality, and we have standards and code of conduct. And we have also, with our suppliers, IKEA Way, we have requirement of our suppliers to treat men and women equally, to hire women, to give them equal opportunities and fair treatment. So we go beyond just what we can influence. And then we celebrate quite a bit um, the days in, in the IKEA events internally and externally so that we um, promote and bring together people who think about gender equality. And of course now we also participate in the UN high level of economic empowerment and there together with the UN, of course, and together with the Prime Minister of Costa Rica, we committed that by 2020, we will have an equal workforce. And believe me, it's one thing to work with our leaders on it, but most of the comments come from our coworkers that are so proud to work in a company that really care. And it comes from men as well as women, those comments. So we start there. And then we go into the competence, because what we found is that sometimes people are afraid, they feel threatened. Um, if, you, if you focus now on women, what does it mean for me? I'm a man, I worked really hard, and now I'm on this succession bench, what will happen to me? So what we do, we create education. So we had a series of creating a gender intelligent IKEA which means let's educate about the differences of the men and women and what is the value that we bring together if we actually learn how to use our uniqueness together rather than asking everybody 
to look and behave in the same way. Then we have a huge series of unconscious bias, and that is actually for every dimension of diversity. We really talk about what are some of our unconscious biases that we are not aware of, and that's why some men will say, but hold on, you want me to promote the women, but what about qualification? Clearly, it's not based on reality. It's based on your unconscious bias that only men can be qualified. Because if we know that women are highly educated, they're highly skilled, why would you even think that we are going to compromise qualification? So going into the unconscious bias, going into the privilege that some people in society take for granted, and then asking them, have you thought about it? It's a privilege how easy your life is, whereas my life is I need to work twice as hard just to be in the same place that you are at. And I think it's fantastic because people just wake up and, and realize, wow, I was just not aware. And then finally, is what I talked about, is the infrastructure. So what we do is, in many countries, we put the infrastructure in place. So if in Sweden and Norway and Denmark, we have paternity leave, just as maternity leave, because it's parental leave, in the rest of the world, it's pretty much, um, no, maybe some countries in North Europe, they also have it. But in many, many of our countries, it's only maternity leave. I mean, in the US, it's six weeks maternity leave and zero paternity leave. So for example, a few months ago, we launched in the US that there will be between four to six months parental leave. It's for men and women. And we actually recognize it. The men, we celebrate the men that take the, par the paternity leave. We introduced it in India, and that was a shocker. We introduced it in Japan, and we constantly track it. We have three guys in six years that took paternity leave, and we constantly go and talk about it. It's good if you took paternity leave. <laughs> it's not going to impact, but it's really hard to transfer, transform people in what they believe it will do. It is not the male's job to take a role at home. So it takes quite a bit to impact people because we are trying to impact their lives at home as well, not only at work. Of course, if they change at home, they come back with a totally different attitude when they come to work. So we introduce quite a bit of infrastructure. We, we support both men and women. The one thing that we don't like to do, and I know some other companies are doing, is providing skills for women. Since I joined IKEA, I said, absolutely not. Because many companies are offering um, how to negotiate only for women, how to, be, how to resolve conflict, and what it actually means is how to be a man <laughs> at work. So we said, absolutely not. We will bring men and women together that will teach and share with each other. So we have none of this. What we did do, and now we are actually changing, we have this I one, IKEA Women Open Network. So it is about gender equality, but let's face it. We want equality, but the world is such that still women are lagging behind. So what we said is, okay, let's call it gender equality, but let's acknowledge the issue that we are dealing with today. For the most part, all over our, our IKEA world, still women are having a hard time getting the same exact opportunities to be promoted as men. So let's focus on them first. And then we will also focus on men once we have a, a, a gap there. But what we did with this I one, we invited men and women. We invited equal men and women. But the result in the last four years is every single one of those events, we go to more and more men and we see the forward invitation. Oh, I think it will be interesting for this person. 70% women in every single one of the events even though we invite 50-50. So for me, it's an eye-opener to come here. 
I'm going to focus now <laughs> more on men because of course we are focusing on people. The people that we invite is people in key leadership positions that you have the opportunity now after this event to go and change your country, function, whatever it is. Well, if it's only the women and they are not the holders of the pop top position, are we going to change something? Or are we going to talk to somebody who already agreed about the topic before? Should we not bring our critical partners on board? And that for me is a lot of learning to be done today. So thank you for that. So what do we look like today? We have come a long way. We have 149,000 co-workers. In our base co-worker population, we have 54% women. Among our management team, we have 48% women, and we have about almost 20,000 managers, and it's 48%. Our group management, which is what other companies call the C-suite in our, we have 50% which is a fantastic accomplishment with the CEO that everybody knows. He champions diversity and equality, and I have no doubts that he will start participating in those events once I introduce him to this. And on our board, we still have 33%. But I can tell you, it has been a progress, continuous progress, but still, we had one year that we said, oh, we are in a pretty good place. We are in 46%. Yeah, let's stop focusing. The next year, we went down. So trust me, if you don't continue putting the focus on it, we go back to our old behaviors. And we go back to what you said also, Peter, opening the position. Every position is open. Otherwise, we go to our boys club and we remember somebody that we know. And before you know it, we go back to more men in leadership position. So to close it, what are some of the learnings that we had? Gender inequality is not a woman's problem. It's a society problem. We know when we have women in leadership position, and we also work a lot with women, with next generation women. We work with women um, in, in India, in Thailand, to create a good economy. And when we hire and involve women, when we support those women, the entire community benefits. So, and, and we also know in India, it's, it's proven that when women join the business, it increases the GB GDP. So it's a society issue. It's not a women's issue. For too many years, it was like, it's a women issue. So let the women solve it. That's why this event is so different. And we know that both men and women are crucial for creating gender equality in the world. And what we also know, and I spoke about it, it's about this being gender intelligent. Sometimes it's the lack of knowledge and it's the lack of awareness that keeps us in the status quo that we are at. So maybe a little bit more education and a little bit increased awareness. And we talk a lot about the heart and the gut, not only the brain. So we say we have three intelligences, the heart, the, the, the brain, and the gut. Let's use all three, and we use all three when we talk about equality and human rights. And like I said before, it's not a number game because we do have some cases that we have reached a number game, and then we go to those events, Everybody dresses <laughs> somewhat the same because everybody is wearing suit all of a sudden you see, okay, so women are, wear as are being dressed the same and they talk the same. We haven't accomplished anything because we don't want to change women to be like men. We want women to be women and we want men to be men. Only then I think society is effective. Um, so yes. Inclusion, 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 inclusion. This is our biggest topic in IKEA moving forward. So in our strategy, 2017 to 2020 is all about inclusion. What are some of the things that you can do in your culture to switch it so that it's the female and the male, it's the feminine and the masculine. And collaboration, 
be beyond IKEA is what we find will really push us forward. And this for sure is one such collaboration that we learn what are some other things that companies are doing that can take us even more forward in where we are. And that's IKEA. Thank, Thank you so you much. much. Thank you so much. Reminds me of um, of my mom. Yeah, another mom story. I'm sorry they pay me to do this. Uh, actually, my mom, when she, when we came to the country, she didn't have any education at all. So my father encouraged her to take one, and she then ha uh, sent it, uh, sent out her resumes different places. She wanted to work with the clothing department, and she couldn't get any job. Um, I'm I'm just gonna give you like. Um, quick break for this story. There'll be a coffee break in 15 minutes. Take it take it easy. I'll just one mom story and one speaker and then a coffee break. I'll okay, so um, then she finally got an interview with Quickly, this big, big supermarket in Denmark, Quickly supermarket. And afterwards she was like, yes, it went very good, very well. And then um, the manager called her and told her that she couldn't get the job because her Danish was very bad. And then she um, was very sad. And then she got angry and called him back and yelled at him at her bad Danish and asked, her, asked him how she should ever uh, learn the language if she didn't have anyone to talk to speak the language with. So she remembered this was a Friday and the Monday after she got the job. She started at the uh, uh, textile department and you know this was the solution of for uh, like about, uh, this was solution to everything. She kept talking about quickly, quickly, quickly at home, you know, and it was like quickly my hair, quickly my hair, as we say in Danish. So, um, and then, uh, and, and you know, there were problems with her because one day she gave a customer a pair of socks, soga, when he asked for sugar, soga. So soga, not soga, big difference. But now, <laughs> many years after, she has not only good experiences in the work field and uh, being a, w a worker, but also she can pass it on to others. So in Denmark, we have this big issue about all the new primary uh, Syrian uh, refugees coming to, how do we get the women to work? So um, last year, she, uh, she uh, made sure that 40 of them could get an employment in uh, the local quickly, one for each uh, employer in quickly had like, he had to make sure that one of the refugees got into the work um, so they could get jobs afterwards, like an internship. And there are problems still with these refugees because they sit by themselves and then the manager would call my mom and say, what should we do about this? And then she would call them and say, hey, try to, you know, nag about your relationship like the Danes do. And then you do that and then they have a good relationship. <laughs> but they also have many like, <clears throat> you know, they ha they've heard these stories about Denmark, you know, and then they ask my mom, is it true this? Is it true that? Is it true that Danes have <clears throat> this day, one day a year where everyone is naked? <laughs> no. And it's actually today, guys. It's today. I don't know um, <laughs> if you didn't get the memo. So, well, the next story um, I'm going to introduce is uh, Bjarne Bjarnason. He joined Reykjavi uh, Energy as CEO in 2011, and the company has since received both the Icelandic States and the Employers uh, Association's Awards for Contribution to Gender Equality. Reykjavik Energy has been committed to uh, eliminating the gender pay gap within the company for over five years and actively increasing the numbers of women in management positions. In his pre presentation, Mr. Bendixson will share their succe successes but also their struggles with us. Please welcome Bjarni. Yeah, over there. Thanks. So, you can hear me now. Is it possible to dim the lights a bit so I can see the screens better? If not, it's okay. Anyway, um, a success story from IKEA. I'm going to tell you what is possible in a smaller company in a tiny little country. Uh, I am a geologist, but I've been in management my whole life. Started with a uh, small company. And uh, over the last six years or so, I've been specializing in gender equality geology. It's quite exciting, if you've ever heard of that. Anyway, this is the company very quickly. 
We are 108 years old. We have water services, electricity, distribution and production, hot water, district heating, wall geothermal, sewage, fiber optics, one gigabit to every home. We serve two thirds of Iceland. So we are a big company on the local market, but internationally we are tiny. This is the group. It's a group of companies. I'm the CEO of the group and we turned it upside down, down as you see, because the mother company is serving uh, the young ones. We are also guiding them and directing them. But uh, the young ones, the, uh, the daughter companies are bringing us all the revenue. So we have uh, the utilities to the left, we have the power pro, uh, producer, and then we have the fiber optics network. Today we are about 500 people. Just a little about, uh, about energy in Iceland. You see it has grown immensely and very quickly. And if this is the same picture, but on a 100% scale, back in 1940, we were 14% renewable. Today, we are 86% renewable, and that is mostly geothermal. There's very little left car traffic, ocean traffic, and the airplanes. Gender inequality, the global picture in the power and utility sector. Power and utilities are very, very male-dominated by tradition, and um, <coughs> I don't like it. This is the global picture. The 200 largest uh, global power and utilities. On the boards, they have 16% women, this is today. And in the senior management, they are 14%. In Europe, they are 12%, the one with blue circle. 23% uh, women on the boards, 12% in the management. So, in 2011, uh, shortly after I came in, we decided two things, among many, many other things. The company then was in very bad operational and financial shape, extremely. It was almost bankrupt. And this was after the banking crisis in Iceland, and uh, I came in to get the company back on the trail. Um, after a short look, we saw that the crisis gave us an uh, enormous uh, opportunity. And this is often the case. If you have crisis, you can do things much faster. Uh, you have all the employees motivated and uh, you have to do changes. You have to reshuffle in management and so forth. Over two years period of time, we had to take the number of employees down by 200 from 600 to 400. And we decided to get this company out in a much, much better shape, not only financially. So two of the decisions we took was to balance genders in the management and eliminate the gender pay gap. And I'll show you how this has gone. First, we take women in management. You see that in 29 or 2009, there were about 20% women in management. But then uh, women were 30% of the t total workforce. We have gradually increased the number, and this is the total management and, and all levels in the company. Now we are up to 51%, and yesterday I learned that women are 51% of uh, the human race. So uh, we are right on the spot. And uh, we can say that uh, six, seven years ago, women were underrepresented in management, if you could use that word, and they are overrepresented, which is not the right t term, of course. So, the gender pay gap, which is big in many countries, uh, r relatively low in Iceland, 10 to 20% in general, we promised ourselves to eliminate it as quickly as we could. But when we started on it, we saw that we had very limited information. And uh, <coughs> the figures we had were always outdated. We sent in our payroll and other information uh, to a university to analyze it, and we got the results back half a year later. And we said to ourselves, this cannot be the 21st century. 
we have have modeling capabilities in all areas of the business and there's no model existing to find out what gender pay gap we have today you have to go five six months back there was no such tool existing on the market so what we did we uh, entered into cooperation with pay analytics it's only a two-man company uh, one woman at Icelandic uh, PhD uh, woman running this company and uh, we together b uh, developed this tool and as I said it was quite unbelievable and um, I may be wrong but at that time no such tool existed so we were just uh, in the dark uh, we now have it and um, <coughs> now we have First of all, we can look at the situation today, the, the, uh, the payroll, and we can develop a plan what to do. Uh, we can see on the lower, lowest diagram, we can see what will it cost to get from 1.1% uh, pay cap in favor of men, as an example in this case, and down to zero, what will it cost annually for the company. And uh, the tool also suggests uh, who are the persons and in what jobs that we want to uh, work with or, or, or change the, the, the wages and we can follow every day what is the situation and so if you need this to uh, be able to predict exactly first of all to know where are you and secondly what do I need to do to change it then you have no excuses any longer. Well, I think it is uh, 5%, 10%. If I do that or this, it's going to take a long time. I don't know what effect it's going to have. So now we will give you the tool. No more excuses. We are down to 1.1% from 8.4%. And we have promised ourselves to go down to zero before the end of the year. Corporate culture, Co corporate culture, just like Sadi Brody said, is, is at the heart of everything we do. Gender equality is a multiple task, really a multiple task, not only headcount. It is not enough to recruit women in STEM jobs. STEM jobs are science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Because research show that if women having this or this education come into a male-dominated company, they will leave. After 10 years, and this is, uh, this is the truth, uh, twice as many women will have left their jobs as men. And the reason is isolation hostile male-dominated work environments, ineffective executive feedback, lack of effective sponsors in the workplace. These are four top reasons that they leave. So it's not enough to hire, you have to keep them. Um, what we did, we did many, many things in this respect, and it's all been quite exciting and very interesting. So this is our company. 108 years male dominated uh, company. Do we really have the right classes to understand how this company works? And we did not. So we hired a gentle scientist to analyze our corporate culture. And she was not very soft on us, I can promise you. Uh, she came up with a report, and there was a multitude of things that we had not realized ourselves, neither myself as a man nor the women in the company and uh, <coughs> we've been working on these observations and uh, many many of the items so first of all the physical and visual environment so we have softened it by colors paintings plants and so forth we've taken down in every workshop we, where the welders are and 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 uh, and the electricians so forth all what do you call it calendars have you seen a calendar in a workshop of a mechanic? <coughs> so, 
We have, uh, <coughs> this is one of the things, we have had courses on gender equality for every employee, every employee, and uh, we have uh, uh, mentors for new employees trained in gender equality approach. Um, we have established gender uh, equality committees. We used to have it in the mother company, now we have in its uh, uh, subsidiary as well independent committees that are working on the issues of their own little subsidiary. And uh, we have made an action plan to follow up on the committee's recommendations. Um, and we have looked into gender adopted recruitment process, very, very in important, extremely important, because we are very biased, very biased. So we have men and women in all recruitments. We have looked at the advertisements, how are the wordings, strong, intelligent, uh, <laughs> the, the word female is only lacking, mm. determined, and uh, <coughs> now we have have uh, differently worded uh, advertisements. Uh, Gender-based statistical analysis uh, for the company. So, so everything you can analyze from the perspective of genders is important. There are so many things. And th the bias is, is, as an example, if you go into a company, and in the management, you have 20% women and 80% men. Women and men will say, yeah, we have both genders. It's a bit equal, equal in management. This is gender blindness. Um, so we hired a specialist in within the company after the, the, the gender scientist left. And, and she is now working with, was has been working with the with the equal uh, uh, equality committees. Um, we have, as I said, worked on the arts. Uh, we've made our own several videos, many videos, three, four, five now. We've made them ourselves, our own, own employees, and uh, they've done all, all parts of them. Uh, in uh, To educate people on sexual harassment, gender pay gap, work and family life balance, and mutual respect. How do we work together? We have revised the uh, working hours, shortened the long shifts for men, so they go and, 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 and uh, can go and pick up children from uh, the kindergarten and so forth. Very well received. Uh, then, because uh, we have, even though the gender balance in the management, we've been looking very much into other parts of the company. And uh, there's one big uh, problem in, in power companies, as you know, that we do not have the trades represented by women. You don't have electricians and plumbers and welders. They do not exist or very little. So we decided to do what we could do to uh, uh, wake an interest for young people and young girls particularly. And so I'm almost finished. Am I getting 15 minutes or just what was left of the hour? Is that 15 minutes? Okay. I'm trying to get this work. It's only one minute. finished. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, at the end it's a question of corporate culture. 
and the management is responsible for the co corporate culture. It does not come from the bottom up. These are the boards, the mother company, four women out of six, and, and uh, so a minimum 40% in all. And this is the uh, job satisfaction. We have done this, both the financial difficulties we have overcome, and you see the rise in uh, job satisfaction, and we are now at the top of the range. The, the black one is the general labor market. So we have a much better company. Uh, we got awards, and finally, my personal experience. What have I learned? Some of these are facts, others are just feelings. And inside the company, we have more open discussion, more diverse backgrounds and points of view. Decisions are taken based on facts, open discussions, and feelings. And feelings are facts, <laughs> actually. The first thing male-dominated companies say, you have to have figures. But in our real life, feelings are facts. Uh, decisions are taken off the table. There's no hit hidden agenda. We have more productive work, higher job satisfaction, better decision, no doubt in my mind, no doubt. Better morale, less workplace bullying. We do a survey, employee survey, every year, very detailed. So these are facts, figures. And less risk for sexual harassment. It's almost gone, almost gone. If you have a, a, a equal or gender balance at the table, three girls and, uh, and, and three men, and someone attempts to go into the, the gray zone in attitude or, or, or jokes or whatever, it just drops that. I call it, call it the, the self-cleaning mechanism for <coughs> sexual harassment. More fun at work, mixed workplaces are better workplaces. Other ob observations, we can change the energy sector and we can do it rather quickly in only five years. Uh, male dominance is not a law of nature. Uh, we receive higher number of, of, of highly qualified applications, better image. Gender equality is a question of human rights, very much so. We, we are all born equal and we should have equal rights. It is the duty of the executive man management to execute gender equality. This is maybe the core of what I'm saying. If you should squeeze anyone, you should squeeze guys like me, 60 years, round belly, thin hair. We are occupying 90% of the chairs of the CEOs of all companies. And if they are not for, and if they don't really support equality, it won't happen. So if you have women on the board, let the women squeeze the CEO and let them deliver because he is supposed to deliver on money, projects, environment, but typically not on equal rights. So why don't you just put up a plan, board members, and you hold the CEO accountable for evening out or, or working, uh, following certain plan decided by the board, and the board shall follow up. You have to deliver on gender equality, like on everything else. And then very, very finally, will and determination is all you need. And if you pictures run very quickly of the boards of the main power companies in the world, take a look. Thank you so much, Mr. Bjarnason. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Very inspirational. In a moment, we'll have coffee over there, and afterwards, we'll have a, a session. Um, uh, and Mr. Gary Barker, President and CEO of Promondo and leading voice on masculinity and male mobilization for gender equality, will lead the session right here in a few minutes. So please go get some coffee over there and we'll have some workshop in at 11.20. We're a bit behind schedule. Thank you. Good afternoon, guys. Welcome back. Welcome back from lunch. Everyone, we're starting our 
fourth session. Miss Finland. <laughs> we're, uh, we're continuing after lunch. Welcome back. I'm glad to see so many of you using our photo booth. And I've just been on Twitter to see what is trending. And as always, the store Bedust, the big, the big Danish Bake Off is at number three. Trump is at number six. And number one is, let me just check, Barbershop Conf is number one trending on Twitter right now. So please use the hashtag BarbershopConf if you want to join the conversation. We hope you enjoyed the workshop uh, before lunch. And uh, this morning, we've been focusing on sharing be best practice examples that hopefully inspired you and led to interesting discussions. Now we're going to change up the gear and discuss where we still much must do better if we want to achieve gender equality. We we're calling it, Are We There Yet? this session. And whereas, well, it's better to start uh, that with some self-reflection. So uh, to help us with this, let me introduce our next speaker. He's an expert on unconscious biases and how they affect us, our ideas and our actions. Please welcome to the stage, stage Mr. Jens Rødbøl. Thank you. So thank you, it's really an honor to be in this room and uh, thank you for the introduction. So um, I come from a company called Living Institute. What we do is applied diversity intelligence. So let me guide you through some of this. The question was, are we here that? And I don't know why I have been given 12 minutes to answer that question. <laughs> but I tried to kind of elaborate a bit on this, but I could give you a very short answer. My answers would be from a practitioner's point of view. I'm not a politician. I'm not from an organization. I'm not a researcher. I'm not an analyst. I, j I do the work with people. So, so this is my perspective. So I will share some of the ideas that we talk with our clients on. So very shortly about me, educated as a musician, I started the concert venue in Copenhagen called Vega. I know this picture is some years ago, but it is still me. <laughs> I've been the director of human resource at Bang & Olufsen. I've done crazy stuff like being nominated to the Index Award for Design for Social Infrastructure. And I'm one of only 10 global master trainers in Lego series play. I can play with Lego. I have an uh, official paper stating that. There is a point to that, and I will get back to this. So <coughs> reflecting on this invitation, I started thinking, when did my journey of creating gender balance start? I remember five years ago, a client called me and said, can you help us in our journey of creating gender balance? Yes. <laughs> and she said, there's one condition you need to send a man. And uh, I was wondering and I was starting arguing, say, well, our best and most competent consultant is a woman. But she insisted, you need to send a man. So now you've got 11 minutes to figure out why she said so. So but I was puzzled uh, around this, but this is how it started. Or maybe not, because then I thought, well, maybe it started a lot of years earlier. This is my family. And uh, why put up a family picture in this setting? Well, just to mention what I see here is two CEOs and a captain in the Danish army responsible for training the next generation of officers for the Danish army. My youngest daughter, she is responsible for 64 men and she is the first female team leader ever in Denmark responsible for this training. So I'm kind of pretty proud of this. But we just did this, they, they just did this. Maybe they were not really aware of the odds they were up against. So let me just see, hands up, how many of you have both a son and a daughter? Hands up. So, several of you. Later, I came across this number, 40 to 1. <coughs> Those of you who have sons and daughters, your son is 40 times more likely to become a CEO than your daughter. 
This is research from the economist. So just reflect for a second. If you look at your son and your daughter, you know, is this the reality? Does this make sense to you? When you look at your children right now, are your son 40 times more competent than your daughter? No. So that maybe answers some of the question, are we there yet? No, probably, probably not. So, one thing I will touch upon that is some of the themes our clients raise with us. And the first one is what we call the business case. And uh, you in this room, you probably know there's a lot of value in working with gender equality, but it's not, you know, not everybody that knows it. I'll just share one of the latest study that I've come across that I think was really impressive. It was done by Nordea. I know there might be some in the room today. Uh, thank you for those organizations that have the manpower to do these kind of studies. It is amazing. So the chief investment officer of Nordea wanted to find out, is it worth investing money in companies that is run by a female CEO or a female chairperson. Is that worth investing in those companies? They looked into 11,000 companies globally, publicly traded companies. They look over eight years period of time since 2009. They found out that the female CEOs or female chairpersons, they made a profit return on 25% versus the average 11%. So that was pretty astonishing data to look at this. That's great news. The sad news is that of these 11,000 companies, only 400 of them had a female CEO or a female chairperson. But really, some of the latest data is on this. So we all kind of, you know, we get a lot of data. There's a lot of reports. So I will not go a lot into that anymore. And this is the second topic we meet when we discuss with our clients. We have enough data. We have all the great reports from the great companies. We have all our internal reports. They are kind of stacking up. What should we do? How should we do it? And this bridging the data with the how seems to be a bit difficult, even though these reports have recommendations. But how you do it real life? And this is where I come in and we come in to this picture. The second thing, or third thing here, is uh, what I call the Nordic dilemma. Do we have a Nordic dilemma? Every time I get into a workshop, I meet at least these three mindsets. Some will say, yes, we are the front runners. We are in the Nordic countries. We are definitely the front runners of this agenda. So, and I will kindly ask these four tables here. Um, you are now have this mindset. You are the front runners. So you don't even want to be here because you know, it's, you know, it's done. So, in a minute when I tell you when, I want you to, all of you, cross your arms like that and look like this, okay? <laughs> these four tables. So, and these eight tables here, you are, you're the one saying, we are really lagging behind. So I, you are so eager to hear more. So when I tell you in a minute, you kind of lean forward and smile. <laughs> you want, okay, understood? And these four tables over here, you just say, Come on, guys, we solved this problem many years ago. So when I say when and when, I just want you to do like that. Ah, get out of there. Is clear? So everybody, take your positions. One, two, three. Yeah. This is my every day at work. This is how it feels like. This is when I start a session, you know, I got you over there, I got you, uh, I got you, thank you, and I got you over there. So we may in many ways be in front, but when I work with people in organizations in the front line, this is how we start with that feeling. One topic that have been touched upon several times today is this notion of the unconscious bias. 
uh, the myth of meritocracy. We all heard it, well, we only hire the best people in this company. And um, ironically enough, the woman that called me that I shared in the beginning, I talked to her later and, and she said exactly that. In this company, we only hire the most competent people for positions, no matter the gender. Well, almost, because when it came to <laughs> us, she wanted the next best. So uh, still, I wonder why they choose a man. But uh, let's see, you still have like five minutes to figure that out. Um, I'm going to start a movie in a second here without sound, if it's on purpose. There's no sound on it. And warning, it is a commercial. And it's for a product that I'm not related to. I don't really need it. Um, but just, you know, it's just a way of saying what are the biases that is going around in the world. And keep in mind, biases can go in all kinds of direction. So let's see if I can start this off. Yeah, it is started. You can just kind of take a glimpse of that while I keep on talking. The unconscious bias, the invisible elephant in the room. The way we kind of label different people and by labeling them in that way it affects our decisions that we make. When we recruit, when we look for people, when we have the interviews with them, we have unconscious biases. It has been mentioned before today, but I cannot stress this enough. So uh, that is how it is. There's always the unconscious bias in the room. If you've got a brain, you've got biases. That's as simple as that. So how many in there got a brain in here? Hands up. <laughs> yeah, we got at least a few brains. Great, thank you. You got a bias. Yes, Pensene Pro, yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, Last thing I'll kind of touch upon are the tools we use in real life to make this change happening. One tool especially is called Lego Series Play. I know there's somebody from Lego somewhere. A big thank you for developing this tool 18 years ago. I was the first one in the world getting certified in this. I've used it ever since. The great thing about this tool, it is the most gender and cultural intelligent tool I have ever worked with. So I keep on working with it. I don't think that was their intention. It's a, it's a strategy tool. So they didn't think of that at that time. I guess I wasn't part of it. But right now, I use it every time when I work with unconscious bias. So uh, again, just some of the stuff that you need to do in this field. You need to work with different tools. This is my colleague, Salman. PhD in psychology, we're giving her the task to explain cultural intelligence using only two pencils. So how do you get across with complex stuff like this? This is my colleague Casper, he's down there somewhere, uh, combining the graphic recording with the research with a, a big audience. Again, we need new tools to come across with the messages and engage people and engage men in this agenda here. The last thing about tools is, it's been mentioned several times, we need to have cultures of inclusion. Earlier this week, we had a meeting with a company, search and selection company, focusing on finding female candidates, and they were doing quite a good job. But they also said the biggest risk was when these candidates got into a culture that was excluding. <laughs> So they could be perfect for the job, but some of them would actually fail because they didn't start up in an inclusive culture. So how do we create cultures of inclusion? The way we do it, we have, with support from the Danish Innovation Fund, developed an inclusive leadership program to learn the leaders to have new tools, new knowledge to create these cultures of inclusion. So, to kind of finalize this, um, there is a future, definitely. And maybe this is not the most diverse group of people we have seen. <laughs> this is the annual meeting of the Financial Council in Denmark. There's a Danish book called Finn Holger. So if you can find a woman, let me know. There are a few up there. Um, 
But this is not my point. My point is that what we meet all the time with our clients, there's a lot of men out there willing to make a difference, and probably also here. So don't, don't miss that opportunity of uh, engaging men in this agenda. So, so they might look like this, they might look like this. I call them men in black. So I think the task is to engage the men in black in for this agenda. And maybe that links to why the client in the beginning asked to send a man. I think she knew at least four things. First of all, men speaking to men is really powerful in this agenda. It makes a difference to engage in this. The second thing is that men meet less bias. When I'm standing up here, I will meet less bias than if my female colleague was saying exactly the same. So, in therefore, some things is easier for me to come across with. Third thing is that you need to recognize that may men like me, older, white, privileged men, also have this feeling of being excluded. Because as one person said to me once, every time we talk gender equality and diversity and inclusion, you talk about everybody else but me. So that sense, if you want to have men engage in this agenda, you need also to understand what is going on in the stomach of men, what is going on in the pets of the men, why do they not engage the way we want to. So I think this, is the, and the last point I think she knew was that, um, that men don't want to be the stereotype version of themselves. So we, f we see a lot of positive energy with the men we work with. They really want to do this. They do not always know how. <laughs> they feel like walking on eggshells. They have difficulties engaging. But you help them. I help them. And this is a hope I have for the future. So are we there yet? Well, not quite, but we are on the way. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Jens. Thank you so much. Thank you. Am I on? Yes, I am. Like, I like your shirt. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So uh, we're a bit behind schedule already, so I'm going to just uh, tell the rest of the speakers to please be respectful of the time. And the next one is a specializes in engaging men and boys in gender equality and is partner and leader of the, Walk the Talk Leadership Program for male business leaders on gender diversity and inclusion. The mission is to help identify how we can go from ambitious policies to successful practices. And this is what Mr. Hulanda will focus on today. Please welcome Klaus Hulanda. Thank you. You actually said my name correctly. Yay! It's, it's actually Klaus Hulander. Normally in international settings, people will call me Klaus Highlander, which is always nice in, 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 in one way. Um, so I'll be speaking about um, a leadership program for men that we run in Sweden. You heard Peter Grönberg from Volvo introduce it uh, slightly before. So the Walk the Talk program, uh, a leadership program for male business leaders on gender equality and diversity, in fact. But we hold gender equality as the lead question that we need to work with here. Um, and Really, I'd like to say it's just one of many, many examples of interventions that are engaging men and boys today and that have this quality of being gender transformative, as we say in the lingo of our business. So, so, um, so it's not in, in any way the only existing program, but it, it's still quite unusual, I would say, on a, on a, especially in the business setting. Um, so my name is Klaus Silander, you caught that, and um, actually I'm an engineer by training. I used to be um, an engineer at Telia and Ericsson in Sweden and held manager positions. Around 35 years of age, I ran into these uh, ideas of, um, or the knowledge about men and masculinity and gender equality. And actually it blew my mind completely because suddenly I, I started to kind of understand what I have always experienced in my life as a boy. Uh, wondering about why I was scared um, um, by other men and boys. If I was scared, it was normally other men and boys that scared me. Um, I'm not saying that women can't be scary. They sure can, <laughs> of course. But I was lucky enough to have women in my life that were uh, more, more followed the patterns of giving support 
and being caring. Um, and when I met uh, men um, where I grew up in, in, I actually grew up in Venezuela, but also in Sweden. Um, I remember one of the men I was scared, or one of the persons I was scared by when I was a kid walking to school was a, a man called um, um, the, the Running a Fox because he had a big red beard. He was, uh, he was an alcoholist and he would always shout at children as we passed by him. So I had many of those experiences being scared by men. And also being as a boy actually being able to identify, I think, women's oppression. I, I could see the sexism, and I was always wondering, what does this mean to me? Yes, I'm, I'm a boy, I'm a, and I grew up to be a man. How, how do I deal with that? Because I think it's wrong, but nobody's really talking about it, except that we are a problem. And it was kind of confusing, I think, being a boy and, be, and seeing myself as a problem and not having a conversation about that. It was confusing, really. Uh, well, so when I met those ideas in my 35, uh, 35th year, it blew my mind and I decided to change my career. So I worked with um, the NGO movement uh, on these issues. Uh, Men for Gender Equality in Sweden is represent, uh, represented here. Luis is the chair over there. I worked there for about 10 years and now I'm an independent consultant and among the things I do, I, I run this program called Walk the Talk. Uh, it actually originated from Volvo, as you heard, uh, from Peter, and it was the CEO, the group CEO, again, the issue of leadership. The group CEO of Volvo, Leif Johansson, back then, who, who backed the whole prog program, understanding that we have to work with the majority culture of the company if we are going to change um, the gender inequalities. And my partner in working with this nowadays, Louise Ekström, was, was the, the mind behind designing this program. Are we there yet, is, is this section of, of, of the conference? Um, of course we're not. Uh, Peter gave a pretty dire picture of the business life in Sweden. I, I would say the business sector is one of those sectors that, that hasn't changed in Sweden in terms of gender equality. Many other sectors have. We have women leaders in the public sector uh, at all levels of, um, of, of leadership as well as in politics. Um, but when it comes to the private business sector, it's a quite um, bad situation. And in a way I would say, I, I very much like what you said, Mr. from, uh, from uh, Reykjavik Energy, that we have to put pressure on top CEOs because they're underperforming. They're not doing their job in a way. They're not leading in a way where everybody who works in the company or the potential that you have in the market is being used. I mean, we are asking them to lead sustainable com companies and part of that is, is social sustainability. And in a way, I would say that companies are externalizing costs onto society. It's very costly for society to have companies that exclude large portions of the, of, of the population. And you already heard the case, the business case. We know that gender equal companies do better financially. So male business leaders are underperforming. It's not good enough. Oops. Interesting, I have water on the computer now. I think I'll need some paper. <laughs> But let's see if it works. <clears throat> if you were a woman, this would never have happened. <laughs> what do we say to that? <laughs> so uh, just a few basic ideas. So when, we, when we bring in the men, at, uh, the, the male business leaders in our program, they tend to think about gender like this. This is their uh, initial idea of what gender is, what gender equality is. Uh, the word gender is equated to women. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> I think we're fine like okay, this. Okay, let's see what happens. Yeah, it's dry enough. I never had moisture in my computer before. <laughs> thank you. So um, this is how how in society in general, but certainly the, the, the male um, business leaders that we have in the program, when we start the program, they think about gender this way. It's about women. It's not about um, 
men. And in a way, uh, men are not visible to them, you can say. It's, it's actually the, the privilege of being invisible. And as you see in this pic picture, you can easily spot the women. It's like we can see the women, but the, the majority in the group, the men, kind of in their large numbers, and, and the men in black, as, as the previous uh, speaker said, are invisible to, to many of us and to them. So my point here is really, I would say that this invisibility of men in the discussion about gender not only sustains privilege for men, because it, do, it that makes us not question men in our position, but it also sustains the, the visibility of men's problems that we talked about earlier. It's almost like it's a taboo in society to speak about the weaknesses or the vulnerabilities of men, which I, in my mind, connect to our power position. It kind of sustains the power position as well. So men are part of the equation too, as we know. And one way of just bringing out the men is using this old image that many of you recognize uh, at least here we see that men are part of the equation, but it's a problematic picture, isn't it? Because it has this old idea that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. You know, kind of really stereotyping, say that all men are the same over here and all women are the same over here. And this is a very problematic idea, actually, which uh, we, we challenge as well in our program. But I would say that this was maybe the starting point for Volvo making this step saying that it's not that the women are the problem. You know, they had tried everything. They were losing female talent. Uh, men that were projected to make a career in Volvo did so. Uh, you know, ma management trainees, uh, uh, they, they went right up through the, the hierarchies of the, of the company. But the women with the same competence that they were recruited at the same time, they dropped out at about 40 at large rates. At the age of 40, they dropped out of the company. And Volvo had tried women networks, uh, mentors for women leaders, uh, gender knowledge, uh, gender coaches for women, but it didn't work. Then, as I, I talked to you about before, Leif Yu Wansona and Louise Ekstrom and a group of people realized we need to think about the majority culture. It seems like the culture at Volvo is excluding to women. And that's the problem. So we need to start engaging men at Volvo, and especially male leaders at Volvo to change this. So um, realizing that men and women do not come from, men don't come from Mars, women don't come from Venus, we live on the same planet. And the philosophy is of course that women and men as individuals are more alike each other than different. We can, we can actually do anything. Men can give care, women can lead businesses, women can lead uh, the national football team of Sweden. Uh, if we, we, can, we can actually interchange all of our roles and ideas that we think are gendered. That's the potential. So rather, uh, as we speak about in the Walk to Talk program, uh, th this is a part that comes from the, the, the the research on men and masculinities that's been done over the past 25, 30 years. Many of you might know it. It's, it's the famous uh, researcher, uh, Ray Wynne Connell, who uh, introduced the concept of masculinities, first of all, that actually there are many ways of being a man, many ways of, being a ma uh, of, of, of acting mas in a masculine way. There's not only one. That's one of the misconceptions about men and masculinities. So, but also that masculinities are constructed. So it's not something biological, it's social. That's the same thing as with the norms for femininities. But in a gender unequal society and in a gender unequal company, you will see these hierarchies build up. And the interesting, what I want to point your um, attention to here is the hierarchy between men within the group of men. So what Connell showed is that there are power relations between different men. So at the top, you will see those men that try to and maybe can sometimes live up to masculinity ideals or norms that are those that give most power in society today. Below those men, you'll see men that are followers that maybe appear to be real men but maybe don't live up to all the ideals, but we get privileged too. 
And below that, you have men that are subordinated to other men uh, and marginalized. And actually, I think here you can start to think about that the, the problems that we heard, men that, that have mental health problems, that have high levels of depression, that commit suicide. It's not, you know, the, the, the reasons for this. Uh, you can see maybe in this, or get an idea from this hierarchy of being subordinated and marginalized in, within the group of men. Now, just to point out, this is a social construct. Women and men can enter these two triangles uh, as, as bodies. So females can, of course, assume masculine traits, but will not be able to reach the same levels as men because their body points them to the, you know, you're not, you don't come across as a real man. It's built into your body. So you have to work double as hard to get the same pay. Well, so when we introduced the Walk the Talk program, uh, which um, is for male managers, uh, the whole idea is really to create awareness of men and masculinity. The, the whole uh, idea of what is masculinity and how do we learn it. And I think it has to do with the idea of if you want to be a good leader, you have to know who you are. How can you lead other people if you don't understand who you are yourself, where you come from, and what shaped you? Uh, and if you want to lead a diverse company, we have to start to understand uh, how masculinity creates these types of hi hierarchies uh, within uh, the companies. Uh, and as Peter said, to, to many of the participants, it's the first time just like it was for me when I was 35, that anyone speaks about the issues of gender in a way where men relate to how does it work for me in my life and in my leadership. So it's actually a quite, um, um, uh, let's say, something that changes a lot for many of the participants. But of course, we need to talk about gender in general and what it's like to be a woman. So we have uh, female speakers coming in, female CEOs, uh, talking to the group of men, but it's very much a process. It's not so much about facts. It's more a process of self-reflection and, and, and talking to other men. Uh, and we teach, you know, how do you interrupt sexism? So if you're at a board meeting or in a, a all-male setting in a locker room or in a whatever, and you hear a, a, another leader or a man speaking in a sexist way or joking in a sexist way, how do you interrupt that? How do you stop it? How do you identify it? Why is it wrong? Why, can't, wh why, why is it something you should stop? So it's also practical training. <clears throat> well, so I'm, I'm really <laughs> happy to say that many of our participants come out from this uh, gender training course, masculinity, uh, awareness training course and say it's the best training course that we've ever had in leadership because finally someone is talking about things that's going on every day in my life that I've never talked about before. And maybe relating a little bit to what uh, Peter said about creativity and productivity. I mean, I think to business leaders, it's quite obvious when you understand how, how masculinity norms create hierarchies. It's, that's, that's not a very creative environment, just like Peter said. So um, to give you a, a one example of what a participant said, he said, you know, finally now I understand why. When I've been in high level meetings with other uh, men in my company and, um, and we, we, we have discussions of, of our, uh, on our work, it seems like to me there's a pattern where all the men are only speaking about how successful they are. And you know, talking about uh, uh, how good we are at things and, and uh, how fantastic my, my department is working. But when we have mixed groups, the dynamics change completely. When we have balanced groups, it seems like we're talking about um, the problems we need to solve instead. It becomes more open. So the, the degree of competition, trying to sustain your position in the hierarchy goes away. So. To learn more about Walk the Talk, please write and I'll be happy to share more information. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Mr. Hernando. Thanks. Earlier today, we heard uh, Mr. Bjarni Bjarnason from uh, Reykjavik Energy talk about how, how male-dominated his sector was. Our next next speaker will also come comes from a sector f uh, known for being dominated by men and has been criticized for a slow process in achieving gender equality. He's already here, so let me just, <laughs> without further ado, uh, introduce Mr. Karol Matila. Sorry. Yes. Uh, head of Government Relations at Nokia, and he will share with us how Nokia is implementing a strategy, strategy involving all layers of the company. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, good to be here, uh, and I want to thank the organizers for this unique opportunity, I think, to discuss it uh, with men. Uh, I think this day has shown that uh, managing gender participation can, you know, there can be it can be valuable pushing men to discuss this topic. Um, I, I hope it's, it's uh -huh. okay. Should be right. Uh, well, this is uh, and and now I'm in a quota. So I, I usually I talk about many things uh, on my plate. There is a future of Europe. It may be uh, trade policies, trade agreements. Uh, telecoms policy, but it's often women that talk about this. Although in our company, it's up from the CEO that care about the topic, uh, it's it's very often women. So this gave me an opportunity to, jo to join you guys. I'm really happy for that. Uh, and in this room, we all know the power of diversity. Um, um, but sometimes even I think a mono-gender approach can be useful. Uh, I witnessed this myself. We, have, we are supporting a Green Light for Girls initiative in STEM. Um, and we had one of the events at, at our headquarters, at our campus, um, where we had about 200 girls, girls only, um, working on science and technology uh, issues or tasks, problems, solving them. And I have to say, um, and I have some experience on working with, uh, with boys uh, at schools and outside schools, and this was almost like a dreamlike experience. And they did, the organizers, they did tell me that there is science behind it that girls work together really well when the boys aren't there. I'd like to believe that uh, for that day, that's probably an optimal solution, but I, I hope that if had that uh, uh, event lasted for a week or month, they, sh they, they would have started the longing for their male, male participants or their peers. Um, But to be here, yeah, I think it's a really, really, it's an, it's been a really a humbling and, and, and inspiring uh, experience, a true eye opener, I would say. Um, so much great thinking and work uh, done on the topic. I, I, I think I, I, while I go back home, I think I have new role models to look up to uh, amongst men, which I think is great. And secondly, and this has been already touched today. Um, um, I have to confess that when I, uh, when I started really thinking about the topic, uh, I, I did some self-discovery. And, and from time to time, I feel a bit lost in this whole gender equality discussion. Uh, and it's close to the feeling uh, that I have participating in some of our compliance trainings. Uh, born and raised in the best governed and least corrupt uh, country in the world, uh, these trainings can feel uh, like uh, getting an update on alphabets. It's like, it's very obvious stuff. <laughs> it's like, it's seriously, someone with a straight face asking you if it's okay to give gift to get an, uh, an administrative uh, permission or something like that. So it's, it's so obvious that it's almost amusing. Uh, and I think sometimes here I feel the same. And this makes me think whether I'm blind or if I don't have enough knowledge. And I, th I think sharing this information today uh, has opened up uh, some of those locks. And I note this not to undermine codes of conduct or diversity debate, uh, the very opposite. I think uh, this is a very, very important uh, topic, fundamental, I would say. Um, I, I say this to highlight the illusion that some of our Nordic and Baltic, in this bubble of ours here, that has been mentioned several times, uh, may hinder us from seeing the full image. So being raised by a strong mother, in one of the most gender equal corners of the world, going to army, uh, going to hobbies, to school, to work with amazing women, I think it, it really sometimes prevents me from seeing inequality. 
uh, and understand the importance of necessary corrective actions we need to take. Uh, so with this context of my personal handicap, uh, uh, and I, I, I think some of you in the audience may share this with me, I hope at least, uh, I will now dive into the, the theme of diversity cap in tech and what we at Nokia are doing about it. So uh, I hope you all know Nokia as a company. Some people uh, tend to think that we disappeared some time ago when we sold our handset business. Quite, quite, quite far from the truth. Uh, I, I'm very, I talk this, I tell this weekly, but uh, yeah, I could go on for hours about it, but it's quite far from the truth. Uh, we're building networks now, a company of 100,000 people uh, working across the world, all corners of the world actually. Uh, many of them are men. So Nokia men represent 78% of our uh, workforce. Yet an even higher number in line managers and senior managers. So in a sense, uh, quite a sad number. Um, and I don't think that this comes to you as a surprise as many tech companies uh, do struggle with the very same issue. Uh, and even across industries and sectors, I think the numbers, when you look at the numbers uh, uh, on European or US companies, um, they aren't very encouraging at all. So it roughly, I think the numbers vary depending on who's, who's, uh, who's stating it, but I think 16% of executives and five to 6% of CEOs are female. And, and those numbers aren't increasing really fast at, at, at all. Um, uh, there have been different estimates on where we would reach uh, the 50-50 balance, but uh, yeah, it will take way too much time. So the progress is way too low. And, and we've realized this at Nokia and, and taking action to spare. And this action is, action is spearheaded by our CEO, by our, our, our leadership team and the board. So I think, and, and well, many of the leadership team, there are females, but actually it's, it's the men who are coming forward and our CEO included. Uh, and we do believe that the diverse workforce uh, will be a platform for us for greater innovation superior performance um, and delivering excellent service to our customers. But uh, yeah, uh, so it's not only the right thing to do, although I think that's the key driving force for us, but it's also a business imperative with strategic implications. Uh, quoting our CEO, our ambition is to have a gender balance that reflects the world around us and the workplace where men and women have equal opportunity to succeed in every function at every level. And at this point of time, it, it doesn't really look like it. So uh, what, what are we then doing about it? Uh, we've come up with the gender balance in our gender balance steering committee headed by our, by our chief marketing officer, Barry French. Uh, we kicked off a holistic five year action plan with a mix of shorter and a longer term actions to engage leaders, uh, to level the playing field uh, in leadership development for talented women raise awareness and inspire the next generation. So uh, we believe that oh, our ambition is to create a virtuous circle for women uh, to thrive and succeed in ICT. So we, uh, the three categories or this action plan uh, consists of three things. One is supporting talented women in taking leadership positions. That's not really happening that well today. And we also want to uh, increase the visibility of our female employees, specifically those in leadership roles, so that the women would have role models. And we also want to, and there are different programs in this. Some stem actually from the employees. So we have an employee co a program called the Strong Her. I'm part of it. There are more than 2,000 people coming together and discussing this topic and encouraging each other. They can be men, mostly they are women, encouraging each other. Uh, then we want to foster a gender neutral culture. Uh, I think we can say that culture eats strategy and plans for breakfast. So this culture is important and I, I hope that also extends outside Nokia to encourage uh, women. Uh, and then we also want to build a long term talent pipeline in helping bringing up uh, uh, girls in STEM. Um, and there are several initiatives. One that I already mentioned was the Green Light for Girls, where we where we try to encourage women to take up to this. And seeing the seeing the excitement myself, I think 
we're getting there. So we would have more more women uh, uh, in. Uh, so we would have a strong, larger pool to collect from. Because if there are not that many women attending these schools, it would be difficult for us to really reach our goals in having more balanced workforce at, at us. So okay, I started with the, the fear that I may be a bit blind or naive when it comes to gender equality. Uh, it just seems too obvious to me. Um, uh, if 50% of us are women and the rest of have daughters and wives who we obviously wish to be happy and succeed in life, many of us are raised by women. Uh, all of us are brought, by, brought, brought to this life by women. Uh, we should all share the same agenda. I think we are really, we are one. And now that we know that in diversity that it's, there is beauty and there is strength, um, we, I think we shouldn't even need to look at all the statistics that show that we can do better in GDP or in, in, in performance. So I think it's, it's really, it seems very obvious, very simple. But I, I maybe, yeah, it's putting it into action maybe isn't that simple and that's why we're here and, and it's been really a great experience for me and I was happy to share uh, the experience of Nokia. Are we there yet? Not, but I think we're going to the right direction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Matilla. Now a familiar, familiar face is joining us, Mr. Gary Barker, that you met at the workshop earlier. And uh, he's a very strong advocate for a very simple truth, that we will not achieve equality outside of the home if we don't uh, achieve equality in the home as well. Mr. Gary, the floor is yours. So yeah, you get to see me again. Um, just doing a check here, make sure we're all awake. It is that part in the day when, yeah, good stretch, okay. Um, I'm gonna try to get at the simple question of why fatherhood and why it matters for this issue of gender equality. Um, first off, the very, well, first off, because I am a father and I have an amazing 19-year-old daughter, but that's a longer conversation and I'll show her picture later. Um, so, but apart from that, let's consider that as a gender equality issue, the single largest factor that keeps women from being in the workplace as much as they would like and working as many hours as men is the unequal care burden that women face. And although we don't always say it, the only way we're going to fill in that unequal care burden, there's not enough Martians to bring here, there's not enough robotic care to provide, is that we need men to do their half of the work. Consider as well the number of men on the planet. We, from demographic data, we have 80% of the world's men are or will be biological fathers, and many of the rest of the men in the world have some connection to children or um, as uncles and brothers in lots of other ways. Consider as well what we know from the field of child development, which is that men as caregivers matter in children's lives. And in fact, from data that we have from about 40 countries, one of the key issues from whether a woman grows up to be in a violent relationship or a relationship with a male partner who treats her equally is if she was in a household growing up where a man was nonviolent and where he modeled more equitable behavior. And consider finally that we as men have a self-interest in this. We have data, a lot of it from the Nordic region, that finds that men who report close connections to their children live longer, are happier, less likely to be arrested, less likely to use violence, less likely to abuse drugs. Our lives as men are better if we are closely connected to children. In spite of that huge amount of data, um, there really has been not a lot of effort, if we can pull these slides up now. I can see them. Do we have to do something up here? I think it's up there, yeah. The slides? All right, I'll continue. Tell There's a, a really cool slide here. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Um, in spite of this amount of data, there has been no kind of global platform that says we need men to do more of this. We need to create the conditions that men do this. Um, my organization, Promundo, started with other organizations with the UN and others 
started a global campaign in 2011 called the Men Care Campaign. It's now active in more than 40 countries. Some of the partners, Man from Sweden has been part of the creation of that, and other groups here have been part of it. And we launched in 2015, Michael Kaufman, who's here, you'll hear from him in a bit, was one of the co-authors of our first report. We did a first global report that we called State of the World's Fathers. That is the 2015 cover. And it was really the first time put on a global stage that there was a report that said, where are we globally in terms of engaging men as fathers and in doing our share of the care work? I'm happy to say it, reverb it, it ended up in about 12 other countries doing different regional or country reports of trying to give a global snapshot. That first report basically summed up what I just said at the beginning of why it matters. And another key point that came out of the first report is that we don't count it. That is, you couldn't find, unlike data on maternal mortality, men's use of condoms, contraceptive use, even rates of violence by men against women or violence against children, there was no global counting of how much men participate in the care of children or in the daily care of our homes every day. So one of the conclusions we came out with the 2015 report is it matters and yet we're not counting it. And those of us who pay attention to data, and we've been using a lot of it today, we know that government, what doesn't count, doesn't count. That is, if we don't count it, we're not including it, we're not setting up global goals. The other thing that's obvious is that nowhere in the sustainable development goals or among other countries do we have any goals about men doing more of it. So our first report tried to put the issue on the map. Our second report we called a time for action. So two years later, we came back, this time, we came back with global data. Working with the Gates Foundation and others, we have access to and did analysis of global studies on time use to see where we are. So this year we have more of a snapshot and pleased to say the Iceland, Icelandic government supported us in the publication and in launching it in June of this year. So why the action one, we can clearly say looking at the data that no country in the world has achieved equality in terms of men's share of carrying out the daily care work. This region of the world gets good marks. Um, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, Finland, did I mention all of them? Yep. Are, it's about men doing about 40% of the work at home, both the care of children and the care of homes, in multiple studies that we have. So in spite of all the noise on this issue in this region, it's still not at 50-50. Um, so we've got no country in the world, even the countries that have made the most progress have achieved that equality. And there's few, if any, countries that have said, we consider it a global goal for men and boys to do 50% of this. So we also think if we don't aspire to it, it's going to be hard for us to achieve it. And it's also quite, it's important to say that it's intersectional. We know that among the poorest households in any country, and certainly the poorest countries in the world, achieving equality on these issues is even harder, particularly for families who don't have the kind of paid supports that we know that the lowest income families need. We've heard these numbers before as well. We know how many years we are away. Some of the figures say, ILO says it'll be 75 years at the current pace of change before we achieve equal pay for equal work. If Counting all the indicators we use on gender equality, the numbers that we cite are about 130 years. Um, I think all of us in the room would agree that that is far too slow. So another reason we need it, um, we need men doing more of this. So where are we? What's the global snapshot? And I'll try to go through this quickly. I know that we're um, trying to make up time for other stuff that's coming along. So not to give you too much data in the afternoon, um, but the global average is that women do on a daily basis three times of the amount of daily care of children and of homes. By region, there's tremendous variation. Um, in the, m the wealthiest countries of the world, these are the developed in the blue to the far, that's your far left, it is about twice as much. In some of the poorer regions of the world, it's 6.5 times as much. And as I said before, there's no country that's achieved equality on that, and it's even not very encouraged, encouraging in the countries where women are most participating in paid work that men are still not doing nearly our share of this. So before I go to the next slide, often when I share that piece of data, lots of men will tell me, yeah, but we work outside the home. We are working a lot of hours as men outside the home, 40 hours and more typically. So doesn't that work count too? Aren't we doing a lot? And I'm taking that income home to my family. Doesn't that also count as caregiving? 
Absolutely. That said, and this is a busy slide, sorry about that, it's small in the back, but the bottom line is, even if you add up our working hours plus our care in the home, and you add up women's working hours less on average than men outside the home plus their hours inside the home, everywhere in the world, women on average work more hours per day counting their work in the home and their work outside the home than we as men do, adding up both our paid work and our unpaid care work. So yes, men, we are working a lot of hours outside the home. I don't make a lot of friends as men when I bring this truth home, but it is in fact, it holds across the world. On average, women are working more hours every single day. So what to do about it? It doesn't matter, I brought up the issue of income. We're achieving something closer to income in higher income countries, but we've still got a long way to go. So what do we need to do? One is, of course, we've got to think about equal pay. We've got to think about what happens in the workplace. The kinds of things we've been talking about here definitely need to be in there. What about the issue of laws and policies? A key issue, and this is one of the ones that needs to be talked about, and I'll come back to the issue of parental leave um, in just a moment. The other, of course, are these gender norms, the unconscious bias you just saw about who we think of as caregivers. Think of how many notes come home from school, from daycare, that say, dear mom. Think of how difficult it is, um, the UN Children's Organization, think of its logo, it's got a mother and a child. No matter where we look, we continue to think that the care of children is women's work, and women have been doing most of that and doing a fantastic job of it, but we need to figure out our own norms and biases about that. The other issue is far too little support for the world's poorest families. Another piece of analysis we did for the report is where and which families around the world have access to either income support or some kind of paid support or paid childcare. Ironically, or perhaps not surprisingly, the poorest countries in the world have the least access to those. And even in the wealthiest countries in the world, the lowest income families, how are we going for time? I gotta wrap it up. Um, the poorest families still have the least access to paid childcare and to, um, to paid supports that would allow them to provide the services that their family needs. So what needs to be done, summing up here? One is this, we've gotta change the norms. Raising our sons and daughters from the very beginning to think of themselves as I'm going to be both a worker, I'm gonna be a provider, and I'm going to be a caregiver. We're spending a lot of time thinking about girls and the STEM professions, and we need to, but how much time are we spending with boys talking about how we also need you to think about being a caregiver when you grow up, and perhaps even being part of the care professions, and maybe we can see those incomes go up for the very low paid care professions out there. We looked at data in the US that found about 8% of childcare workers in the 1980s were men. Look at that data again in 2005, it was still 8%. Um, we, as we look at caregiving in the home or also as a profession, it's still mostly seen as a mother's, um, as a woman's profession. Leave policies, we're gonna talk some about that. We have hinted at those. Our conclusion in this review of them, some of the best data coming out of this region, is a couple of truths. If we want men to take leave, it's gotta be fully paid. If we want men to take leave, it's gotta be non-transferable. We often hear corporations and some governments saying, oh, we've gotta make it flexible because each family figures it out. What each family figures it out means, as long as men's wages are higher, the wages that will be given up are almost always women's. To let families figure it out, Thanks. <laughs> to let families figure, figure it out means that we usually perpetuate gender stereotypes. The platform that we're signing on to is Men Care and as the 40 countries that are part of it is a campaign called Plent that comes out of Spain, which means parental leave equal and non-transferable. That is, have it be for each parent, biological or else or, or otherwise, and have it be a right and entitlement that goes to the individual, not to have it transferable. And never to reduce the days, but to go from the number of days that mothers have and raise days for fathers to be equal to those. Countries that do that are getting further to achieving equality. And we will also make the argument when corporations push, push back or governments push back and say we can't afford this, we'll say think about a worker's life. The average worker in a workplace is working about 40 years. Oops, I gotta run out of time, I have zero minutes left. <laughs> okay, time, why does it matter? About 40 years, how much is it for us to cover? Most of us are now having one or two children in our households, let's say two. 
How much is it for us as a corporation or a country to support two years of, those li of, those, of that work life in caring for your children? Among the common things that we're, that are, we're proposing are those. So I will just end on this one. What happens next? Well, families vote. <laughs> and for those of you who happen to be you know, in the political realm of things, politicians who support paid and non-transferable leave seem to be getting reelected. <laughs> These policies do matter, and I think those of us who are citizens here can put our voices behind that and say, we need this, we need to nudge men toward this. It does take the norm change, but it also takes statutory change. And I'll stop there, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Gary Baca. Thanks, Gary. Very interesting uh, thoughts here. Not completely agreeing with our ministers earlier today. If um, anyone finds any th of these pointers interesting, please feel free to tweet about them, as I encouraged you earlier, using the hashtag BarbershopConf, and also the handle, at, uh, which has the same name. So now, uh, Michael Kaufman, PhD, will take over. He's a speaker and writer fo focusing on engaging men and boys to promote uh, equality between men and women, uh, promoting uh, involved fatherhood and violence against women. And you're also the co-founder, now I'm talking to you, because yeah. you're standing next uh, to me. me about you're also a co-founder <laughs> of the White Ribbon Campaign, that right? That is so true. Yeah? And you're going to take over from, uh, for, for me today, but this but afternoon. I'm off. Right? Thank you for the Thank incredible job Thank you so much. Have done. a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. We've got about a half hour left. And what we want to do is to take a general discussion, an important discussion, and really turn, take it one final step. And that is, how do we take these ideas, these ideals about the promotion of gender equality, the promotion of gender justice, the promotion of changes not only in the lives of women but men, and how do we make them part of our personal commitment? So I'm going to be doing a, a several different things. I'm going to be talking for a bit in a minute. I'm going to be talking to a hip-hop artist in a minute. And we're also going to hear from six individuals, three from uh, the public sector, from governments, three from the private sector, who are just going to talk about the commitments that they are going to make or their department are making. Um, and so to start that off, uh, just we're going to sprinkle these a bit. I'll start with Ulrich Vestergaard Knudsen, who's the permanent secretary um, from the Foreign Ministry of Denmark, just to say a couple of words. Wait, 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 you, you don't know what I'm going to say. It's a little bit too <laughs> early. Um, we were asked, the ones who are going to uh, do commitments here today, to talk about the why and the how, and then also what is the actual commitment. For me, uh, the why actually has to do what's in the subtitle of this conference, mobilizing men and boys, because for me, actually, it's a generational thing, because something happened from my boyhood to manhood <coughs> regarding gender equality. When I was in primary school, I did not consider gender equality a problem ever. The same in high school, again in university, I looked around, we were 50-50. I started in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs 23 years ago, it was 50-50. We were all equal competitors. I came back to the ministry after a, a few deviations uh, four years ago, and I looked around and suddenly it was not 50-50. Where were all my old uh, female friends from high school, from university, and from when we started in the MFA? So this actually started for me as a, as a fairness thing. So what did we do? We tried to uh, lift uh, uh, our level in terms of uh, providing a food chain for female talents. We introduced personal profiles, we introduced interview panels, we tried to do gender bias uh, uh, stuff all around the uh, organization. But as we uh, sort of dived into this problem, the why uh, had a different answer to me because it turned out also from all the available evidence that it's actually not only about fairness, it's also about creating results, that gender diversity, as a lot of other diversities, by the way, do actually create better results. We've now reached a 50, 50 at deputy manager level, which is quite an achievement, but we're still struggling uh, at, the, at the higher levels in, 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 in the ministry. So that is uh, the why, that is the how. The commitment, uh, I thought the best uh, commitment I could give myself and the uh, surrounding world was actually to make it measurable, to be accountable to, uh, to not only the men and women in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but also to the outside world. So we introduced uh, a year ago or so, as the very first ministry in Denmark, a gender equality sheet. So we actually went public 
with both our, uh, our um, feeding line, how many promotions are we doing, what is the status in different uh, uh, fields, how many female ambassadors. And uh, luckily so far for the first couple of years, we have seen continuous improvement for, but from, some, from low levels. So my commitment uh, here today, and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's also what I would plead others to do, is make sure that you make yourself accountable and measurable, because otherwise it'll be difficult to transfer these drivers into real results. Thank you. Good. Thank you. <laughs> you now, you might notice on your uh, tables now there's a, a red postcard. I'd like to ask everyone to um, uh, turn it over and address it to yourself. This is, going to get, this is going to be mailed back to you later. So just wear that address side. Just take a second, address it to yourself as, I'm, as we're continuing. Um, that shouldn't be too hard to do. Uh, just put your own name and address on it. So while you're doing that, and I'm going to tell, talk to you more about that in a minute, um, I'd like to uh, bring up to uh, the stage, although he's very shy being on a stage as a hip hop performer. Um, but I think he's gonna be able to handle it for this group. Uh, but we're gonna need a microphone too. Um, we have another mic. We do. I'd like to introduce uh, Shaka Loveless, who is a Danish hip hop artist. Welcome to the, uh, welcome to the stage. Come up for a conversation. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Let's come over here. Thank you. So. Um, Part of what we're doing here, if I'm going to introduce this, this segment, you know, when we talk about change, it happens on so many different levels. A lot of us think about the change in legislation, the rules that we pass to guide our societies. A lot of us may be talking about changes in our workplace, corporate governance, decision making, training, leadership. A lot of us talk about change within our own homes. Gary was talking about that, that form of change. People get active in things like he for she. They make use of the barbershop toolkit. There's change on so many different levels. But what we want to focus to end this today is on personal change. Now, personal change isn't the be all and the end all. But personal change goes hand in hand with broader social change, making that personal commitment to change. So we thought it'd be really interesting, as part of this final session, to talk to a man who is figuring out how to bring those messages of change, that uh, different ways of being a man, into his own work as, a, as an artist, as a cultural worker. So, so welcome, and I guess as a, as a first question, mm -hmm. as a musician, as a songwriter, uh, you shape ideas of young men, well, and probably not so young. Um, and, and you're helping create the images of masculinity for a new generation um, about gender, about love, about life. How, what's that like? What's it's that like a, for you? <laughs> it's a responsibility, but, but I'm happy uh, to have it. And I think for me, writing songs is, um, I come from a hip hop environment and you do have a kind of a macho thing going on there where we kind of uh, perpetuate certain ideals about how to be a man. And uh, I don't want to come with a, you know, with a lifted finger telling everyone that's not the way to do it. I'd rather just start with myself and uh, try to be honest in the songs that I write uh, about my life, about sometimes being a good man, sometimes maybe not being a good man, but most of all being um, vulnerable Mm. Uh, in this life and uh, I think that, that that's the way to do it for me because um, then people can kind of they can kind of take it or, or not take it but at least when they're going and, and they're singing the lyrics then then they see that there is a, a different way of being a man than just being perfect and uh, having success so it sounds like part of what you do I mean is say as a man to men we need to have an authentic conversation about our lives. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's not just telling them, you better do this, but saying, this is what I do. So starting with yourself, starting with the honesty coming from yourself. I think that's very important, especially if, if I can just Yeah, like no, please, talking. this is about you right now. So. Uh, uh, yeah, so I've been here for an hour, and it's been really interesting. 
Uh, but where I live, it's a place called uh, Napo, and uh, it's the most dangerous place in the world. No, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes you you, you kind of think it is. Um, we we have some young men and boys out there who are in kind of a bad situation because from a quite an early age they start feeling left out of society, and um, those are kind of those are who I really want to relate to because I think that they're being um, left alone a little bit. And when I look at those uh, uh, boys and, and young men, I just see an enormous potential. Um, they have a lot of energy and uh, through positive um, means of motivation. I've, I've seen it happen, so right. I, know, I know it's yeah. true. Uh, they they can really um, they can really do good things for all of society and for their families, being uh, fathers maybe later on, but but also um, for businesses and and for the whole economy. Chaka, you know when you, you talk about man, young men who feel left out, mm -hmm. and we get some of those uh, because of racism, mm -hmm. some of them because they've they're not being economically marginalized. How does that? feed into misogyny? How does that at times feed into attitudes that are really putting down women? Um, if you feel like you got nothing, then you mm -hmm. kind of grab uh, anything that comes near you. And mm -hmm. in, in some of these uh, areas, there is this uh, uh, macho masculinity. So um, if you feel like you're, you're never gonna make money, you're never gonna get the education anyhow, um, then, then what to do uh, to to get status to feel like you're worth loving, which I think right. is a is a big uh, factor in all of this. Um, you you kind of you 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 turn even more macho, and uh, I think for some of these guys, they they grow up in a country with maybe parents telling them that uh, this is is bad society in some ways. Uh, so, and they're also feeling a bit left out. Then they start going to uh, the clubs, which is uh, something really important in Danish culture. And when they go to these clubs, they see um, young uh, women acting in a way that they're not used to seeing. And at the same time, they're seeing that the ones who have uh, success at the club, let me put it like that, uh, are are the ones um, who are either rich or famous, and they feel like it, it's not uh, possible for them to reach those goals, so they reach try to reach some other goals, which is I'm the strongest, I'm the leader, and um, I really think a lot of those guys actually don't even want to be in that setting, but they don't know where else to go. So if there's a certain ideal of the man is on top. Mm -hmm. <laughs> different people are going to have different tools to be on top. Yes. Um, and some, it might be, you know, the power of their wallet or their social position. Others, it's going to be the use of violence, perhaps. It, it could be, and I think that's, uh, that's when it turns really sad. Yeah. How has, you know, since you started as, as, as an adult, you know, going out of uh, the childhood that in different ways we all shared it as men, but as you became conscious of these issues uh, as a man, as a performer, and started speaking out, uh, singing out, being out there as a man who's presenting a different vision of masculinity implicitly, not, as you say, not <laughs> lecturing, but just uh, implicitly. How has that changed your view of yourself, or has it? Hmm. So these interesting. are not, we, we talked about all sorts of other <laughs> questions, and these are not the but ones. I, but I, I, I yeah. like the question, because yeah. sometimes, like we, we live in, in, in a Instagram, Facebook time, which is good for some things, but this, uh, the hunt for likes, uh, I think is, is a little dangerous. I have to say, I don't consider myself being uh, a front runner or a, a, an especially a perfect person. And I think that's actually what I get from my songs. I see all my own uh, limitations, but you know, I, I still try to better myself. And I think that's interesting, the, the journey towards uh, learning about yourself, learning about uh, uh, family and all these things. I think that's really interesting. And am I there yet? No, but <laughs> hopefully I will. 
But you know, as a man, all I can say is that that is such an inspiration for me because when I hear another man say that, that actually gives me permission not to have to sort of pose as a certain way, mm -hmm. but just to say, here we are as human beings sort of struggling through our lives to redefine images, ideals, expectations that go back thousands of years. So thank you for being part of this. And I just have to say to anyone, Denmark Chaka has a, uh, a new record that's dropping in a month. <laughs> in a month, yeah. <laughs> Watch for it, Christmas gift and all that. It's going to be good. Anyway, Hopefully. Shaka, thank you so much, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we'll see you again. Thank you. Good. Thank you. On your postcards as we continue. Are you not for us? No, he's not. Um, he, yeah, sorry. I know it, it's it's would be much better than me talking actually, but uh, but you're going to be doing shows in here in um, in Copenhagen, right? In Copenhagen in November. In November. Watch for it. Um, so um, on your postcard, by the way, what I'd like you to do sometime during this session, you have about almost a, you know, t 20, 25 minutes, but I'd like you to think of a commitment that you personally can make to yourself. This isn't to anyone else, just to yourself about maybe one thing, maybe two things that you will do over the next few weeks, the next month to promote gender equality, gender justice in your own life. It may be something in your home, it may be something at work, it may be something in the nation as a whole, whatever it might be. But what I'd like to ask you to do as you're thinking about that, just write that down. No one's going to look at this, but write it down. And our fine organizers are going to mail this to you in a, a month or two. And you're going to get this mysterious thing in the mail and you go, oh, did I do this? So um, just, you know, in the background, be thinking about this and write that down. You'll just leave those on your table. Well, continuing with this theme of, of making commitment, um, I'd like to, uh, I'm going to call on a few others. Uh, first, two more uh, people um, with government responsibility, and people are just going to speak from where they are, um, and then three from the private sector. So next, I would like to ask uh, Jan Rohm, who is the Deputy Director General for the Ministry for Social Affairs of Estonia. Uh, Jan, where are, oh, yeah. there, okay, great. <coughs> Hi. Uh, challenge and uh, commitment. Uh, uh, I'm responsible in Ministry for uh, Labour and Employment Issues, so I have a lot of challenges. But in, context, in this context, uh, for me, is the biggest challenge the, I could say, huge uh, gender pay gap in, uh, in, in Estonia. Uh, it is uh, one of the highest in the European Union. It is over 20%. This means that if I took two coins, one euro, Regular, you have everybody, this even more than one in your pocket. This is the men gets, uh, and the second coin is, is a coin of a woman, a Estonian woman. Uh, it, uh, oh, it is small. One fifth is cut from this uh, coin. These are who are on back seats, you don't see, like most of Estonians who don't see this difference. So, and if you show, they don't believe. They start to speak about uh, methodo methodology, about uh, that uh, exactly this company is, is uh, justice itself and uh, it's not possible. So it's very important to make this, infor make this information uh, accept, uh, not, uh, accessible to all who are connected with that. Uh, so uh, I think this is the biggest challenge. There are one, one more thing, we have two sectors, business sectors there. Uh, women get more than men, a little bit. One of them is uh, ICT sector. And ICT sector is considered to be one of the uh, most uh, successful in Estonia. Maybe there is some connection why it is so successful. I hope so. Uh, but my, my commitment is, uh, is uh, to, to find and, uh, and implement uh, from the ministry the best policy is to make these coins the same size. Uh, I hope the bigger size, not the smaller size. Uh, both to men and, and women, through regulations, through uh, providing information, uh, creating incentives, and so on, so on. So this is my Great. main challenge. Thank you very much. And the third commitment is uh, from Ramo Parsonen, member of the Swedish Parliament for the Socialist Party and head of the Parliamentary Committee on the Labour Market. Thank you. Uh, my commitment is to boost the necessary of sharing parental leave 
in, a, in an equal way. And uh, I think, as we have heard here before, it's time for action. Uh, I'm so convinced that this is the key issue if you want to have the same opportunities regardless of sex. You know, my former workplace uh, was a steel mill before I was elected as an MP, and it was a really masculine environment. But I have made a, a, a huge variation drive. And now I, I commit myself to campaign and meet lots of speci especially industrial workers and others, trade unions, to have an ongoing dialogue about the reforming of our legislation on parent parental leave. And the goal must be to individualize it. Uh, and uh, to have a better understanding from many more men, especially men, but even women, from, uh, so they can everyone understand the, all the benefits uh, it achieves, let's say, full-time jobs, no gender pay gap, sharing household jobs, happier children, and why not, as we heard earlier, oh, I heard it yesterday at the dinner, it le all means also that this will be better sex for ma <laughs> mom and dad. And I want to say, uh, end this to say uh, thank you, Iceland, for the hosting us and congrats to your uh, success in gender equality and, of course, in football. <laughs> I just have uh, one humble uh, remind to give you. The football successes saw it with a Swedish coach. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to hear um, we're going to hear three from uh, the private sector now. Th these are going to be shorter. These are going to be along the lines of the commitment that you're writing down. So for the for the next three, uh, these will be even shorter than those. Just the commitment that you are going to make. We're going to start with uh, Hans Erik um, Schekrud uh, um, from the vice president of the Norwegian Union YS. Thank you. I commit commit to always uh, challenge employers and young men to strengthen fatherhood through longer paternal leave and staying home with sick kids. Thank you. Good, thank you. <laughs> Our next one is, uh, that was a model by the way, brevity, thank you. Uh, the next is coming from uh, Sigmund Gro uh, Jensen, head of uh, organizational development for Deloitte. Thank you so much. Uh, I came here uh, very aware of the importance uh, of bringing men along on this agenda. Um, I leave here very inspired with how to do that. And my commitment today is bringing those hows back to Deloitte, integrating into the initiatives we're doing. Some of them are committing male champions of change, not only at executive level, but throughout the organization. It's about shedding light on how gender stereotypes disadvantage men just as well as women. That has been a big theme for me today and also about new angles of how training can be executed to actually um, create this equal support around the agenda. Yeah. Great, thank you. <laughs> and we have uh, Tony Isaacson, the Secretary General of Norway Cup. Hello. Um, uh, I, I, must <laughs> <laughs> I must show this ball. Uh, I'm uh, representing the largest football tournament annually staged uh, in Oslo, in Norway, and uh, we are very proud of uh, being the ambassadors uh, from, uh, for UN and the SAG goals. And uh, that's why I'm holding this uh, football, uh, being all over the world, and uh, we have played all 6,000 games uh, during our Cup this year with this ball. And, uh, I why I mention this is that uh, maybe the most important uh, goal for me is uh, partnership. And I think uh, when you uh, gather all the goals together, uh, then you have uh, influence on the, uh, the gender equality as well. Um, so my commitment uh, is to work towards more gender equality in football through strategic partnership. We believe working with partners will strengthen our work for more equality in football by working closely with both federation and grassroots level football, we used to facilitate arenas for players and coaches to have their voices heard and how to best organize and structure sports to recruit more girls and to keep them playing longer. 
through working with other events, sponsor and media partners. We will strive to make both the sport and the events more attractive and more visible. Last but not least, by giving young girls the opportunity to develop leadership skills and give them leadership roles in sport, they will see the, that sport can give them even more possibilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're ready to... Great. Can we get it on these? There we go. Good. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to those. Now, th that last one is going to need a big postcard to fit on, but if you write small, it's going to make it all. So do, do add to that. Well, if we could bring the, the PowerPoint back onto uh, those screens, please. Thank you very much. If we just leave it up there, please. Thank you. Um, so what is this barbershop discussion? What is the discussion about engaging men? What's it all about? Where's it heading? Where does our commitment fit into all that? Well, let me first say what it is not. Because I think often when I'm speaking, when my colleagues are speaking to audiences, particularly of men, there's a lot of men who walk into the room and they're looking terrified because they're feeling, uh-oh, discussion of gender issues. I'm about to be crapped on for the next you know, hour or 20 minutes or whatever I happen to have. So let me be clear from the start. A discussion around engaging men is not a discussion around pointing fingers, as Shaka said, or, or collective blame. It is not saying that men are a bunch of monsters or anything like that. It is not saying that men are a bunch of dolts and idiots. But at the same time, what it is saying as men talking about these issues is that men should not be scared of powerful women, nor should we be scared of powerful girls. But what we need to do, which we haven't done, which we haven't done, is we need to make men visible within a discussion of gender. That was one of Claus's points. This is a bizarre thing. The half of humanity that for 8,000 years has controlled societies, controlled discourse, controlled religions, controlled economies, controlled governments, as gendered beings have been invisible. And so what we're saying is we need to open up a discussion of gender and saying this is not only a discussion about women, although that would be valuable enough as a discussion, but we have to understand the ways that gender is about the ways that we have all constructed our lives as women and men or however we define ourselves. It's about the relations of power between women and men, but also the relations of power among women and among men. It's about how our lives have been constructed because of multiple identities, the parts of us that are defined by our skin color, by our religion, by our accent, by our social class. All of this becomes part of the picture that we need to make visible. Now, what does it mean? What does it mean to make men visible? Well, one of the first things that it means is that we have to start understanding, as men, those men we in the room as men, have to start understanding better the realities of men's power. Too often I hear these days, we're in a post-feminist reality. You know, yes, it was a problem in the past, but that was only the past. Well, folks, yes, it was the past. And yes, things are getting better. They are getting better because of the strength, the power, the courage of women. But in spite of that, we still have a long ways to go. After all, we still live in countries where men are making, as we've just heard, uh, depending on the country, um, you know, 130%, 140%, 150% uh, of, what, uh, of what women are making. We're still living in a world where men control most levels of government. This is my, famous, my favorite um, men controlling, this is the North Korean parliament, I don't know what they're called, but anyway, a lot of men up there are controlling things. You know, most of our political leaders, most of our religious leaders are men. That's still the reality that we're dealing with. You know, men control the economies of the world, and let me just say what a great job my half of the species has done on the economic front over the past decade. You know, we still live in a world in which we've sexualized men's power over women. These ideas of stereotypes don't exist in isolation. They're about relationships, and we've sexualized men's power over women. 
We've, you know, created a world, as Gary was talking about, where in spite of incredible changes, women still do disproportionately more of the work in the home. Now, luckily, we are seeing some homes, and probably some of you in this room, where men, and in, in a, if it's a male-female household, where men and women are doing equal amounts, or maybe the man is doing more housework and child care. But the averages are still disproportionate. That's still a reality. We still have a reality of forms of sexual harassment at the workplace that plague far too many workplaces. We still have the reality of job ghettos, places where disproportionately women or men work. And if it's women working there, they tend to be paid less and appreciated less. And as we go up the corporate ladder, we still see more men at the top. And these are the types of realities that making men visible as part of the discussion is about why because we have to acknowledge our place within that. And one way we do that is by listening, listening with respect to the women in our lives, women in our workplaces, women in our homes. It doesn't mean listening and, and agreeing with everything we hear, but listening means listening. And so part of barbership, Barbershop is about listening. It is about listening. Now, why should men support gender equality? Why should men support gender justice? You know, some people say, well, no, that, you know, there should be one argument. Well, there's actually many arguments. And we need to marshal as, as thoughtful people, as leaders in society. Let's marshal whatever evidence, whatever arguments we have. It is good for productivity. It will unleash incredible capacity in nations to produce, to move forward, to get ahead. In the value of trillions of dollars, we know that now. It is good for productivity, it is good for companies' bottom line. But it's also good if we want to promote healthy workplaces, safer workplaces. It is also good if we want to reduce and end violence against women, and indeed all forms of violence. If we want to promote shared parenting, for many different reasons, but you know what? We seem to fixate, and even though there is a business case, I think sometimes we fixate that on that a bit too far. And by doing so, I don't think we show respect to our business leaders. I remember a few years ago, I was giving a, a talk in, in, um, in Australia, and it was two members of the rugby union. These are rugby players, uh, coaches, managers, and team owners. And there we are in the Rugby Hall of Fame. And I'm speaking about why the rugby union should speak out in favor of gender equality, should speak out against violence against women. And I was speaking about the issues, and then I came to you know, the, the real heart of it. I posed a question to the audience. I said, why should you be speaking out for gender equality? Why should you be speaking out against, to end violence against women? And I had in my notes that their answer, I had the answer, because you know, just like a, you don't ask a question unless you know the answer. I had in my notes, they were gonna say the business case. And of course, the business case for them is they want to attract more women fans and spectators. It's a, you know, it causes real headaches for them, to say the least, when a star player is arrested for beating up his wife or girlfriend. It's bad for their image. It's bad. All this stuff, they were going to tell me the business case. Here's what happened. I posed the question, and up, you know, why should you speak out against, to end violence against women and for gender equality? This one man stood up. It was clear he was not the owner. It was clear he was a player, because this man was big. He was no taller than me, but his neck was the size of my shoulders, basically. And as you can see, I've got absolutely massive swimmer's shoulders being, you know. Anyway, um, but he was a big, big man. And he stood up, and I said to him, so why should you speak out? And he sort of look, looked at me like I was crazy. And he just said, well, because it's the right thing to do. And he sat down. Didn't need a business case. He didn't need anyone pushing him. And later I talked to him, and he ta talked about the love, his love for his wife, for his daughter. He talked about growing up in a pretty rough home, and he realized that it was the right thing to do. And that's what a lot of it comes down to, it's the right thing to do. But making men visible within this discussion is not only about men supporting gender equality, gender justice, women's rights, and that is a big part of it. But if gender is also about the lives of men, then it means that we've got a question. We've got to look at, we've got to look inside ourselves, as you were saying, 
And we've got to ask questions about being men because we're confronted with a strange paradox. We do live in a world of men's power. And that those societies, what we call patriarchal societies, probably go back about 8,000 years. And here's what happens within that. We raise boys to fit into that, to be the men within a society led by men. So what happens to, from boys? What starts happening at a really young age? You know, the, one of the most wonderful moments of my life was when my first kid was born. I, I wasn't, I have two children. One is, uh, this is when my son was born. Um, and I'm, that really was the greatest moment of my life. And you're thinking, what a sexist pig. Why wasn't the birth of his daughter the big? My daughter is a stepdaughter. And for some reason, the parents didn't invite me to the birth. I, I don't know why not. But anyway, so the most wonderful moment of my life, my son was born. There we are in the delivery room. My kid had been born five seconds. I didn't yet know if it was a boy or girl. Not because I'm stupid. I know the difference. But at that point, I had so many tears in my eyes I couldn't see the little thing <laughs> and I mean the little thing on the little thing I didn't know if it was a boy or girl until the nurse spoke and the nurse you know went from speaking in her normal voice her voice dropped down really deep and she said it's a boy what a strong little fellow I was totally shocked not because it was a boy I'd taken high school biology I figured there was a 50 50 chance I was shocked by the change in her voice and what she was saying about my son's future the word man was being stamped on his head. He was being measured for his first football jersey. His whole life was being charted for him because of one little itty bitty difference in his body. And that's all it took. And that continues and in a most, it just continues on and on with the toys that we buy, the clothes that we buy, the expectations, the images that are out there. You know, this notion that, you know, boys and men are supposed to be fearless. You know, you're supposed to, if you do sports, you play through pain. You know, we ridicule the, you know, the man who sort of cries because it's not a manly thing to do because we are fearless. You know, we, we, we teach boys to fight. We teach boys to, to, to fantasize about, you know, power, whether it's through the gun or through the power of language. You know, all this is part of the background and foreground of boys and men's lives. And when we can't live up to that, what do we do? We humiliate boys. We humiliate men. Because what we say to men and boys is not just that, you know, be a man, but we say you will always be a man. You will always be strong. You will always be powerful. You will always be in control. You will always have all the answers. You will make more money. You will have endless sex. And, of course, only with women. That's, only, that's the only sex that counts if you're a real man. We go on and on. And you will be not only be able to fight, but you will be able to take the pain. You will be able to drink, you'll drive a big car, you make a, you know, endless, endless, endless. And when you don't live up to that, and no man can live up to the whole smorgasbord of, uh, of demands, um, what do we do? We humiliate that man. And it starts in boyhood. The little boy who falls down and cries, we say to him, don't act like a little girl, act like a man, grow up. We humiliate boys for having feelings. And that we take into our developing brain because what is happening during these early years is the most explosive period of our lives and brain development. And we are taking in a gendered reality and we're fitting it right into our developing brains. We become gendered. But for boys to become gendered, we are trying to assume this armor, this armor-plated version of who we are. But like a suit of armor, it just can't work as something to live within. And so what happens for men, for boys, is we can't live up to this. We become obsessed with, you know, am I manly enough? We become torn apart. Too many men live in isolation and loneliness. And so all those things that we heard about earlier from Sven, for example, higher rates of suicide, higher rates of imprisonment, higher rates of addiction, using violence, dying younger, a growing sense of hopelessness, all of that is a result of a paradox. Yes, we live in a society of men's power, of men's privilege, of men's control, and that's all true. But the very ways that we have defined men's power, the very ways that we have given permission for men to control the world, have a cost to men ourselves. In other words, this is not a discussion about, oh, men are victims as much as women. I don't think so, because men have had power. 
But the very ways we've created this world of power comes with a huge cost to men. And so the work that we need to be doing and that some of my colleagues have been doing in brilliant ways around the world, incredible ways, incredible work, is to create a safe space, not the idea of a barbershop, creating a safe space for men and boys, whether it's in a concert hall, whether it's in a discussion group, whether it's in a workplace, whether it's in a manager's office, whether it's in a home, but creating a safe space for making a difference in their own lives and those around them. And that, in part, means embracing feminism. Why? Because feminism is, I think, the best thing that's ever happened to men. Because what it does, it says to human beings, you don't have to be trapped as women or as men. You don't have to live within structures that have systematically denied and hurt women, destroyed too many women's lives. But at the same time, in a paradoxical, bizarre way, have come with an incredible cost to men ourselves. So what can we do? What can we do to make a difference? Well, I think there's several things that I'd like to share with you. First of all, I'd like to just invite, particularly the men here, but everyone here, to make a personal commitment to be a workplace leader, to be a leader in government, in society, in your place of worship, if you're, if you're a, a, a church or mosque or synagogue or temple goer, in your community, in your household, in your locker room, make a personal commitment to be a leader for gender equality. This isn't something that happened next year, next month. This is something that happens now to make that personal commitment. The second thing I'd like to invite you to do, making a personal commitment to bring change into your personal life. It's easy for me to stand on a stage and go, this is what we should do. But what happens in my home? What do I do there? It's not enough for me to be an advocate. It's not enough to, for me at my workplace to say, this is what we need to do. What are the values that I'm contributing within my family? How am I raising? What model do I give to my son and daughter of gender equality, of gender justice, of new ideals of masculinity? and valuing new ideals of femininity, whatever those things even mean, because those are just ideas. And so the making that personal commitment in one big area that Gary was talking about and others is around the transformation of our households of parenting and to make that personal commitment to take advantage of parental leave, to be a leader. There's a picture of Mark Zuckerberg taking off parental leave. You see the map behind him? The, the, I think those are the countries he owns now. But, uh, but anyway, <laughs> but whether you're, you know, um, you know, most of us aren't Mark, but um, even someone making billions less, um, you know, making that personal commitment uh, for bringing about equality. And the third thing, making a public commitment to lead. This is a picture um, that, that jumped out of a campaign that I uh, helped start called the White Ribbon Campaign. And it's a campaign that's encouraging men to speak out against violence against women because we know that most men don't use violence in their lives, but most of us traditionally have been silent about the violence. And through our silence, we've allowed the violence to continue. And this campaign is spread to about 90 countries, including this one from Australia, where the Australian Air Force, uh, Army and Air Forces um, have done extensive workplace programs about creating gender equitable, violence-free workplaces. And, and it, to both to symbolize that and to get out the message, they started sticking white ribbons on, on their planes and other things. So making that public commitment. Well, let me, um, let me tell you a story. By, by way of ending. And this shows about the capacity of men to change. Several years ago, I met a man from Pakistan, and he was from the Swat region. Now, when, he, when I first heard this, when I met him, this is a number of years now, I didn't have, a, I'd never heard of the Swat region. Many of you have now, because that's where Malala is from. But he came from the Swat region, and he had gone off to law school and while he was at law school, there was a coup d'etat. And so he returned to his, 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 uh, his province. And the Swat region, he described, it's a remote tribal region, very sort of, a uh, lot of sort of fundamentalist types. And what the, the generals did to try to curry favor with the fundamentalists is they passed a law called the Hudud Ordinances. And one of the, the ordinances said that if a woman was raped, to prove it, she had to come up with four male witnesses to testify on her behalf. 
Guess how often she could do that? Well, never. At which point, she would be charged with adultery. And when she was convicted, because she was always convicted, she would either be thrown into prison or even executed. So this guy comes back from law school. He sees this happening, and he says, wait a minute. This is not what I've been learning for the last four years in law school. He said, this is not what Pakistani law is traditionally about. And he also, because of course he's a Muslim, he says that's not what his religion taught him. So you know what he did? He started defending these women, and he got them off the charges. Well, the response of the powers that be was to trump up some charge, and they threw him into prison. Now, I don't know if uh, any of you have been in, well, into a prison, um, but prisons even in you know, the Nordic countries, which are you know, the most humane in the world, are still horrible places. Well, you can imagine the hellhole they threw him into in this remote part of Pakistan. They threw him into prison. And then the story gets worse. Can you imagine for a second what happened to him when the other prisoners found out why he was in prison? Can you imagine what they did? And whatever you just imagine, you're probably wrong. Because when the other male prisoners all found out that he was in prison for defending the women in their community, they all went on a hunger strike. And I can tell you, this was not a place where they had nice uh, you know, buffet lunches with choice of food. They all went on a hun hunger strike. And they said, we are not going to eat until you release our brother from prison. And they won. If that can happen, in Pakistan under a military dictatorship, at the time in a country with you know, very little of a women's movement, without a history of laws backing women's empowerment and women's rights, if that could happen there, think what you can do. Think what you can do in the most gender just countries of the world. Think of the resources that you have. Think of the models of strong women leadership already in place. Think of the connections that you have. Think of the influence you have. Think of the money that you have. Think of the worldwide influence you have and use that. Take that as women. Take that as men and say, we're proud that we are leaders. We're proud to be leaders in this work to create gender justice, gender equality. What we are doing is changing the world. What we are doing is is turning around 8,000 years of history that have harmed women in systematic, ongoing ways, and as we know more and more, also bring a cost to men ourselves. This is the time to do it. Not as a task for next year, or next month, or next week, but when you go home today, when you go to work tomorrow, this is the time for everyone in this room, all of us, to take a stand, to stand up for gender equality, to stand up for gender justice, to stand up for ideals of masculinity and femininity, to basically sort of tear up the old ideals of both of those and say, let's be human beings for a while. We can do it. And as we work together as women and men, what you and I are doing, and this is going to end the day for us folks, but please stay around for refreshments. But what you and I are doing as we work together as women men, and men, we are creating a far better world for women. That's absolutely true. And that's ultimately what has inspired us to be here. But we are also bringing about a better world for men. And most important of all, we're bringing about a far, far, far better world for our children and our grandchildren. I want to thank the organizers. I want to thank all of you for being part of this today. I want to thank you for the work that you are doing. Keep up with the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.
Y yes, I, 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 a little announcement. The refreshments are upstairs where we were for lunch. Yes. Where we were for lunch. Please, uh, please come and join us.